It's the Wake Up Call with KB and Andy on 93.5 and 107.5. The Fan. Five winding down, throws it up from midcourt. No good for the first time in 55 years. Duquesne has won an NCAA tournament game. Try to get it to Townsend. Watts out to Cole, corner three. Nope. Reeves puts up a three. No good. And Oakland with a March memory of a lifetime. All right, we're going to enjoy about 45 minutes of this. And then we're going to get ready because we got a chance of a lifetime. It just, this isn't the end of it. You know, this is not the end of it. We've got more. And, and the only way we're going to win Saturday is to stay focused and take them one at a time. We're going to do that. Coach, Jack, we appreciate the show, guys. Go enjoy it. Appreciate it. We're not a Cinderella. Wow, wow, I tell you, what a what a first day of the NCAA tournament, and uh, it keeps going today at noon. Welcome in. We're going to talk about it for the next three hours here on the Wake Up Call. As always, we're broadcasting live from the DriveHubler.com studios. I'm Andy Sweeney. I have Mark Dykton, who I'm looking at. Now, Kevin Bowen uh, is on a little bit of a mini spring break, and you know when you're old, you're no longer going to South Beach, Mark, or Panama City. You're going to Bloomington in the Holodome. So, KP, good morning to you, sir. How are you? Well, we have made the trek over 45, 46. We are uh, over in Nashville, Indiana. Beautiful. So. Not not, yeah. not the Woo Girls in Nashville, Tennessee. Not Broadway no. with Jay Query. Slightly different <laughs> Broadway, t- Broadway Street versus where we are here in Nashville. But a great time last night at Hard Truth here in Nashville, Indiana. And got home just in time to see Perfect. the Jack Golke show. I, I, I just... I'm still in awe, uh, frankly, Andy, from seeing that (laughs) out of him. And the story is just, frankly, it's what March is all about. And uh, I don't care if the other upsets didn't work for me. The fact that Oakland beat Kentucky, and that was an upset, and it's Kentucky, and now we talk Coach Cal's buyout. Oh, God. Yeah, I did did have have to smile. For people that don't know in a former life, uh, last night would have been a very long night for your boy (laughs) following the Kentucky, and a very early morning, by the way, KB, following the Kentucky basketball program. So, you know, I'm on my way in listening to the fan here, listening to uh, Unsportsman. I cannot like them on, but again, this is the part of the national media that flies in, uh, you know, when it becomes March Madness and NCAA tournament time. They were talking about you got to get rid of Coach Cal and his $30, $40 million buyout. You got to go get Billy Donovan or Brad Stevens. I was like, all right, man, if that's what you want to go with. But I don't know. If you're Matt Painter, and we'll obviously dive into a ton of Purdue today in action tonight against Grambling State. I don't know. If you're if you're Matt Painter, and listen, they're going to win tonight. But even uh, for Sunday, you know, you look around, and, and yes, not every upset worked for us, KB, but NC State won, and Oregon won, and Duquesne won, and you had Oakland obviously <laughs> winning. We were all wrong on McNeese State. We all faked it with McNeese State, and they lost by 30. Uh, or whatever it was, but an absolute dynamite day of college basketball. And the beauty is we get it going at 12-15 later today. You know, the interesting thing about yesterday, Andy, is we didn't get a lot of late game drama. Sure. Unless I'm missing it, Dayton is the only one possession final score. Uh, You had a little controversy late in kansas Samford, but Kansas was up 20 in that game. Like, if you would have told me at the start of the day, hey, we're going to get four 11 seeds or higher win. I'd be like, oh, man, sign me up. That's, you know, that's great. Well, every 11 seed won yesterday. All three 11 seeds got it done. And then, of course, you get Oakland. Uh, but, again, we didn't really get the late game like Furman, Virginia last year on opening day. We certainly didn't get anything like that. And, you know, you and I brought up the hypothetical yesterday, Andy, and it certainly did not play out. But yesterday, the entire bracket for Purdue did have their games, so the other six teams or the other six games in their bracket in that Midwest region, and the two through five seeds made it through the opening round, and again, a lot of people had questions about Kansas and their health. A lot of people had questions. Certainly, I was one of them. You were also on that boat with uh, Gonzaga and some questions there, so Tennessee, Creighton, Gonzaga, and Kansas all advance in Purdue's region, And, and you know, I don't want to speak for all Purdue fans, but man, Andy, it just feels like this this damn game's got to get here. Like enough of it all, enough of the 
we've got to sit in it. Oh, and God. We've got to I'm so tired it. of I it. Mean, yeah. That has been the th- and, and you know what? Part of it is. It's their fault. You, you get the bed that, that, that you've made for yourself. And so, yes, it is their fault. But, damn, can you imagine Matt Painter waking up today? And there's got to be an element of just like, finally, we are here. And here is now our opportunity to certainly uh, take a total 180 from last year. Yeah, I thought yesterday, you know, listening to, I don't know what time it was, 1, 2 o'clock, something like that. I think it was actually before the open practice. They met with the media, KB, and and he basically said that very thing. And by the way, the questions that were posed to Matt Painter, he is so nice. He is so very nice. I think every question he got, because the locker rooms are open, so a lot of the better national media and all the local media, they're going into the locker rooms uh, and getting basically one-on-one with players. And so what's left out there was asking some of the more horrific questions uh, to Matt Painter. He was very nice in answering all of them yesterday. I mean, one of them was, how do you how do you – uh, you'll love this. How do you, how do you uh, get to the final? Coach, how do you get to the final four? Coach, he how do you actually get answered to, that. Yeah, and, and no, man, again, he's very nice. So many other coaches would be AHs, but I thought, you know, he basically said, we want, you know, they're here, we're here, we want to play, and I guess the thing that stinks is you wait uh, to all the way, uh, what time, 725 or so tonight. Now, one thing, if you're going to Gamebridge, and I know, Kevin, I know this is on your list because I tweeted you about it last night. Uh, and it happened in Pittsburgh uh, for the late games. The early games there in Pittsburgh ran long. And so Kentucky and Oakland started with a not very full arena. And I knew people there with like six minutes to go until tip-off. The place was really empty. I mean, it filled up in those final couple minutes in the first. By the time you got to the first TV timeout, it, it was a much better atmosphere. But again, you know, they clear everyone out. So in GameBridge today, after the early session, they'll clear you out and then herd you back in so if you're a Purdue fan just be kind of ready for that just be you know if you're pounding beers just be ready you might just stand in line uh for a few minutes as well but you're exactly right you know I want to talk about it as we go today uh and that and that is you know what's 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 at stake here not today but you know probably starting Sunday facing off against an eight or nine and then as you go uh, in this NCAA tournament, what is really at stake for Matt Painter and company? But boy, uh, what a good day of basketball! And Kentucky losing last night has set the college basketball uh, college basketball world on fire, man. It's unbelievable. And correct me if I'm wrong, Kentucky Oakland got pushed back nearly a half hour as well. Yeah, about right? twenty Tip about tw- about twenty minutes. Yep, yeah, about twenty so again, minutes. Just something logistically for Purdue fans heading to Gamebridge Fieldhouse tonight. You know, we'll obviously hit a ton of Purdue today. And just a couple items of note. I am curious to see where Braden Smith is at tonight. You know, can you beat Grambling State without without 100% Braden Smith? Certainly. But, you know, 9 of 33 in the last three games with a couple injuries thrown in there. Um, I love Braden Smith. I think it's an All-American. But, you know, Purdue's not playing deep into March or certainly April if they don't get him at that sort of level. Um, and Matt Painter, again, did lay out a few keys for a tournament run. We'll go over that. And, you know, this time last year, Andy, what we saw on that Friday night against Fairleigh Dickinson, I've made the analogy all week long, I thought we saw a Purdue team that was afraid to play in the mud. And that's not how I describe Purdue at all. Um, they are a one seed that is very much a, we'll do the dirty work. We have guys that play to their roles and don't just demand the ball or play like a team that, you know, bowed out last night in round one as a three seed in Kentucky. Um, it is a very, you know, team that understands what the puzzle pieces are and where they fit into that. But again, I just thought last year uh, in that opening round game, it was a bit of too cool for school, which you know, I like kind of not playing in the mud a little bit more as that analogy of you know, guys passing up shots, guys not, you know, diving on the floor for various loose balls. That is something that I think I will be watching for uh, tonight with the Boilermakers. Again, that is 725 approximately emphasis on that, it is a high-energy Friday morning, and guest-wise, we have Greg Rakestraw joining us at 8. Bruce Weber, the former Purdue assistant, of course, at 8.30. Always enjoy our conversations with him. And then the one and only, and boy. <laughs> she's going to be heartbroken, isn't she? She's going to be heartbroken. <laughs> I guess she can maybe just dial up Caitlin Clark highlights to try to ease the pain. The one, the only, the pride of Kentucky. She is Lynn Dunn, the GM of the Fever. She's going to join us coming up 
at 9.30. So our first conversation with her since the lottery and uh, the Fever getting that number one overall pick. A couple other items I did want to make sure we snuck in here. Andy, shout out to East Chicago, Indiana native Jermaine Kuznard. It might have been the least watched game yesterday. Uh, the Indiana product goes for 40 for Oregon. He transferred from South Carolina. He's, he drops 40 against his former team. Oregon moves on as an 11 seed. Uh, who would have thought we have two A-10 opponents, or <laughs> A-10 teams, I should say, playing for a trip to go to the Sweet 16? And no matter what happens tomorrow, Andy, we will get at least one double-digit seed in the Sweet 16, thanks to NC State continuing their run, just a wild run through the, a the ACC tournament. They won last night against Texas Tech. It'll be NC State and Oakland, 11 versus 14 tomorrow night. Yeah, you mentioned that being maybe a, a little bit less of a watch game. I think I, I actually watch a good amount of that game because I did have Oregon. It's one of the you know few things that I got right in the bracket. I would say the most unwatched game was Washington State and Drake. That's what <laughs> I would say. And I was stuck. You'll love this. So, you know, normally, and I even Drake had a lead there I and kind of let thought, it get I away. I thought they were going to win the game. I thought they were going to win the game. And I'm like, man, we're starting to peg quite a bit of these, right? Outside of McNeese State. I'm like, we're actually starting to get these right. You know, it's funny. And I even tweeted this yesterday. And we'll get back to Purdue here in a second. That, you know, I was I was laughing because, you know, a lot of times, you know, right now I don't have a life. Having a six-month-old, right? You know, there's not a lot going on. The wife's working and doing other things. She's not taking off for March Madness, right? So, you know, I'm sitting there, and most people, it's a it's a go-get-food time or run to the liquor store or take a smoke break or do whatever you're doing. You know you know what I'm talking about. About 6 o'clock last night, what were you doing? Were you having dinner with the family? Because that's when, that's when we had our standalone game of Nevada and Dayton. And so I'm sitting there. It's a 13-point game, and I got 45 minutes to kill before the next round of games uh, come on. And I'm thinking, this is the worst absolute game you could have dating Nevada nobody cares you know I got to make my Steve Alford joke that he's had the same haircut since 1982 and uh and but it ended up being a really good game and Nevada choked that one away but I would say the least watch game of the night for me uh was Drake and Washington State and just on Purdue's side I, I thought one thing that was interesting I don't know how much you saw of this. I mean, obviously, Kansas was up big. The block at the end, it wasn't a foul. Sanford got screwed at the end. I mean, there's no doubt yeah, about it. That was it. the pure anticipation it, call. Uh, a thousand percent. A th and, and by the way, we review everything. Every We review everything, uh, but we still get that call wrong. I, I thought low key, this was going to be worrisome. Creighton came out and was not good last night or yesterday afternoon. I don't know how much you saw of that game. They were up five at halftime, but they trailed or were right there tied much of the first half. The second half, they opened it up. They won the second half by 12 and looked much better. But, boy, I, tell you, I had Creighton going you know, to at least the Elite Eight with Purdue in just about. I have two or three two brackets, and both of them I had Creighton and Purdue match it up in the Elite Eight. So uh, that was an interesting matchup as well. But, I mean, your spot on for if you're a Purdue fan you wake up this morning if you're a Purdue player if you're Matt Painter and that coaching staff and it has been a solid bleeping year of of bending the knee of bending the knee how you lost to a 16 seed and what happened the year before in the sweet 16 and how can you have all of this talent and everything else and not go further in the tournament not get to the final four in national championship and, and this is it after a year of having to put up with annoying Indiana fans and a year of the national media poking fun of you and other schools poking uh you know fun at you this is the opportunity to start something and for a guy like Zach Eady and Braden Smith and even Matt Painter what's on the line I mean to be to be a legend quite frankly uh, is on the line right now and it starts tonight and quite frankly KB I think they win big tonight and it's going to set up an interesting matchup on Sunday I really do just get a to the damn game I mean that's a long day like man Purdue, it's 12 uh, hours I mean, it's 7 15 right now they play what time 7 20 tonight and it's 12 Hug hours your Purdue fans send the text just get to the damn game. I guess we should mention Hunter Dickinson, his health in question coming in the tournament, 19 points, 20 rebounds, and five assists. If you're looking at a potential 
Sweet 16 matchup down the road there. And if you look at the ones and twos yesterday, Andy, it almost seemed like it was universal. All of them kind of flirted with a little bit of like, wait a minute, we're 10, 15, maybe even 20 minutes in the game. And that and that 15 or 16 is kind of hanging around. You brought up Creighton and Akron. Uh, Arizona. Kind of hanging around. Yep. Arizona, Long Beach State a little bit there. Uh, and then, you know, the ones and twos, you know, showed why they are, you know, seated at that level. So, obviously, that'll be something to keep an eye on tonight. And I, I just I, I cannot get enough of Oakland and Jack Golke. Like, <laughs> the man. <laughs> the Wolverine I, I, haircut. He kind of looks like Steve Alford's son. <laughs> he totally does. He really does. If Steve so Alford texting, and Billy Donovan had a son, that's what they would look like. So, obviously, I start to get into a Hillsdale College rabbit hole last night once I, I'm finding more out about him. And then I'm also reminded, oh, wait, he's out of eligibility. So, IU fans, calm down there. He cannot enter the transfer <laughs> portal. Um, I texted Paul Casaro from UND. Um, they played in the same regional as Hillsdale last year. They actually both lost early in that regional, so they didn't play each other. But I was just – I mean, hell, I was looking for anything on the goal key kid. And when you look at his stats, because, you know, one of the reasons why I picked Oakland, Andy, was they've got another kid that puts up shooting numbers yeah, yeah, just the, like Golke. The Lampman kid, yeah. 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 And, yeah. And, and, Who could and hit anything, anything last, night. last night. No, he didn't do and anything. Their, and, and their stud, Trey Townsend, hit some big buckets, but still, he wasn't highly efficient by any means. But I cannot get over Jack Golke. <laughs> <laughs> 335 field goal attempts on the year. It's unbelievable. 335. Eight of them are two-point field goal attempts. <laughs> I love it. Is that it. the life? I, I mean, it's just, he's a, he's a legend. He is an legend. absolute legend. He had the, boy, the Wolverine cocky, haircut. You know oh, yeah. And it's not like the shots he was taking. Oh, it's wide open. They're working it around. Whoa. No, it's like he's taking, like, step backs, running off a pick and a curl and a pin down and everything else and hitting and hitting deep threes. I mean, we saw him at the Horizon League tournament. I'm like, who is this guy? He's just <laughs> dropping. He's, like, doing fallback threes and everywhere on the court. It was wild. Yeah, I you mean, saw I him up close. Audibly, I forgot about that. I audibly laughed at some of the three-point attempts he had. And when he when he banked the one in, I just you know I was cackling at that point. But shout out to the legend Greg Campy, forty years in the making, just a hell of a story there. Uh, I tweeted out last night when the man won the Horizon League tournament at the State Fairgrounds. He said the only spot he could find food late night was the Free Spirit in Castleton. So shout out to the Free Spirit in Castleton. They need either a Greg Campy shot on the menu. They really or do. Greg, whatever Campy ordered uh-huh. that night. Needs to permanently be on the menu. And Andy Sweeney, we pray for the Kentucky message board moderator. Brother, it's it, it's it's on fire. I told you, besides Matt Painter, that Calipari had the most pressure on him because, and I know, I know we got to go to a break here, but, I mean, this was, you know, much like Purdue. It's interesting. Now, their teams aren't the same, but the parallels are kind of similar. This was the team for, for Kentucky. They brought back guys. They got guys to come back. They weren't the normal starting five freshmen uh and even though a guy like you know they had two guys dj wagner and aaron bradshaw who were they they, both of those guys their recruitment was like romeo langford for indiana fans it was a big big deal they both go to kentucky bradshaw can't get on the floor dj's okay but reed shepherd was a star dillingham uh, was a star this year, and they had returning players. This was su- supposed to be the perfect mesh for Calipari. In 2001, Cal missed the tournament. He lost to St. Peter's in 2002. He lost to Jerome Tang in the round of 32 in Kansas State in 2023, and this year he loses uh, as a three seed. And again, on top of that, it's not like where Kentucky's not like Purdue is Purdue's winning the other things. Purdue win a Big Ten tournament. They'll win the Big Ten by three games. Cal doesn't win the SEC. SEC tournament. He doesn't win the regular season SEC, and now he's not built for March either. Uh, and they can't do KB. They can't do a damn thing about it unless they're going to pay over thirty million dollars to get rid of John Calipari. And I just don't think they're going to do that. Why would they? If I saw this correctly, three hundred thirty thousand. Greg Campy makes annually. John Calipari wow. eight point yeah. five million. Just God bless March. Don't change it. Don't touch it. It just it, it is it's amazing. And we saw that last night thanks to Jack Golke and the Grizzlies of Oakland. All right, we'll get things started of course today. It's Northwestern and Florida Atlantic. Fun Indiana ties in that one. That'll be twelve fifteen. 
And, of course, the Boilers, approximately 725 tonight. 25 and a half point favorite if you missed any of our interview with Dante Jackson Grambling coach we'll play some snippets of it throughout the show but again high energy Friday Greg Rakestraw Bruce Weber Lynn Dunn hopefully your bracket is somewhat intact if not embrace the chaos thank you for spending this Friday morning with us it is the wake-up call right here on 93.5 1075 the fan query and company
Brought to you by the Women's Basketball Invitation Tournament. Elevate the game at the inaugural WBIT coming to Hinkle Fieldhouse April 1st and 3rd. Oh, man, reminder, big show uh, coming up here. We'll get to your check down in a second. Greg Rakestraw at 8 o'clock, Bruce Weber at 8.30. Lynn Dunn coming up in the 9 o'clock hour. All right, let's jump into it. Purdue and Grambling State tonight right down the road here at the Fieldhouse. Purdue 27. Uh, KB, it's up to 27 and a half points. Was it 25 and a half yesterday, I think, when it opened? 27 and a half point favorites are the Purdue Boilermakers tonight. Uh, yesterday. Matt Painter, head coach, met with the media. One thing he talked about, it's something, KB, we've talked about quite a bit, turnovers. They cannot turn the ball over in this tournament. Here's Matt Painter. When we've taken care of the basketball, I used to always talk about this and say, you really give us a great chance to win. When we've taken care of the basketball, we've won. And so and it doesn't mean that we can't play and have 10 turnovers and lose the game because we can, but we haven't done that. If we've had 13 turnovers or less, we're 23-0. And so I always hang my hat on that. And if you go look at the games we've lost in the NCAA tournament, you go look at the games that we've lost this year, which are four, we have 14 or more turnovers in those games. So don't turn the basketball over and give yourself a chance. And like I said, it's not ironclad, but from a number standpoint, it's been that way so far. Look at Grambling, Andy, if we go back to the other night, again, they don't shoot a lot of threes. They only shot 10 the other night, a slower tempo. Dante Jackson, their head coach, had some great quotes with us uh, in talking about, you know, wanting to pretty much throw the kitchen sink. And, and you know, we'll quadruple team Zach Eady if we ha- if we have to. Uh, they were 2-10 and 10 to start the year, really got run off the floor quite frequently by NCAA tournament teams. They have won 10 of 11, that only loss in double OT. A couple of Indiana players, Jalen Johnson from Manuel right here in Indianapolis. Uh, he played some big minutes for them late last, uh, late the other night. Uh, so, again, approximately 725 tonight over at Gamebridge Fieldhouse. Purdue and Grambling State, and boy, you are right, 27 and a half. So that is now the biggest spread. UConn is still at 26 and a half. That is the biggest spread here in round one. Yeah, I would say the only thing, the two things I would add to it, the over-under has come down from 140 and a half to 138 and a half. I guess that's kind of interesting. You know, it's a lot It's a, it's a a lot of points, especially if you think Purdue runs away with it. Maybe they don't score as much at the end. Grambling, you know, we understand they're not going to be, I'm, we don't think they're going to be able to hang. I think if you're Matt Painter, last thing I'll say on this, if you're Matt Painter, you know, you can look at, just a little bit of what Oakland did to Kentucky, right? The way you upset someone is a guy's got to get hot and you limit possessions. And I'm interested in who is able in this tournament, if Purdue loses, if they lose because possessions are limited. And that's when the turnover, that magic number of 14, I actually think it it should be a little bit lower, but uh, Matt Painter saying 14, you know, that's what Oakland did. They limited possessions. That's what Ohio Ohio State did to Purdue uh, just a few weeks ago. They limited possessions, and, you know, you turn the ball over 14, 15, 16 times along with limited possessions. A guy gets hot from three. That's how you lose in the NCAA tournament. It won't happen tonight, but that's for, you know, Sunday and beyond. Pacers 10 o'clock tonight, so that could be honestly right at the tail end of Purdue and Grambling State. It is out in Golden State. At Golden State tonight, uh, the Warriors favored by four and a half in this one. Based off results from last night, not that this was ever really a debate, but the Pacers have clinched at least a play-in spot. They actually haven't been in the play-in since uh, uh, the old Nate Bjorkren. Uh, Great effort. What what, what do you say, Mark? Good job and good effort. What was his post-game quote that Uh, one night? No, it was – what do you say? I don't I got pulled. I I don't remember off the top of my – but we can't really remember the Nate Bjorkren days. It was such a dark period. (laughs) <laughs> well, it, yeah, it, it's all it about the, the togetherness season. and the readiness. I know that's one of them. <laughs> togetherness and, and the, the readiness. readiness. Thank you. Uh, just beautiful by Coach <laughs> Nate there back a few seasons ago. Indiana has won four straight road games all by double digits. Again, that first matchup with the Warriors, Steph Curry was incredible inside of Gamebridge Fieldhouse. He is back from his ankle injury. And now Trace Jackson Davis is getting a lot more consistent run off the bench. He was the He was the walk-on story. Uh, a little over a month ago at, at, at Gamebridge Fieldhouse. He now is playing pretty consistently and producing uh, at a pretty consistent mark as well for the Warriors. So, again, that is 10 o'clock tonight as the Pacers start three games out west before concluding this five-game in total road trip 
with Chicago on Wednesday. They have a very high care factor. Uh, it's just about the readiness and the togetherness. <laughs> like there you that. go. The care, the care I mean, factor. I love a very that. high that care factor. Like me describing like Rosie's, you know, third grade basketball team one day. Oh goodness! By the way, speaking of TJD, he has six straight games, KB, where he scored double figures, couple double doubles in there. Seven of eight, he scored uh, in double figures. Speaking of bigs, uh, locally, Malik Renew announcing yesterday he's going to be back at it. Who did he announce that with? Is it Hoosier? hysterics is that is that the uh do they run the program is it quinn buckner and those two dudes <laughs> that run the program so. I, I think so yes yes i don't know who would be third on that list is dolson even third on that list does he yeah. get the bronze medal on that yeah. list I, yeah. I don't know so malik renew uh he's gonna be back and then just you know for your viewing today reminder we get things popping at 12 15 on cbs uh the 8-9 game florida atlantic and northwestern so uh dusty may perhaps his final game at fau before he goes and takes a big job you'll have the overlap at 12 40 with baylor and colgate the 3 14 and then we get things going uab san diego state marquette kentucky yukon new mexico and clemson and everybody else so that's kind of the setup today as we get things popping at 12 15 and again a little rundown from yesterday we'll continue to go over the bracket you had four 11 seeds or higher three 11 seeds actually and then oakland is the 14 all advance we're guaranteed to get either number 11 nc state or number 14 oakland into the sweet 16 shout out to duquesne with their retired coach greg rakestraw's got a great story about keith dambrot tied it here locally he'll share with us coming up at eight they pulled off an upset and boy if you're Colorado State did you get contact COVID from Virginia <laughs> I didn't think were they hanging around Virginia too COVID. much did you see how many points that. they scored yeah they scored 44 they scored 11 in the first half that was to me that ended up being the worst game of the day was Texas yes. and Colorado State a low scoring game neither team's gonna make a run nobody cares nobody cared about Colorado State Texas sorry to them fly Dayton Flyers they come back from 19 to beat Nevada that will be our opener on Saturday Andy so I know we're maybe getting ahead of things if you're looking at Purdue tip times for Sunday but it's Dayton Arizona at 12 45 that's in Salt Lake City that is such an early start time boy that is out early. there did you see Gonzaga, uh, Kansas will follow standalone 315 and then Michigan State UNC at 530 Andy it's not often you get the one versus the nine and if you look at the preseason rankings Michigan State was ranked fourth in the nation to start the year oh yeah North Carolina wasn't even really a top 15 team in some preseason polls um, so that will be one to keep an eye on Carolina is only a three and a half point favorite in that matchup. Did yeah. you see that uh, at the Salt Lake City venue, their Wi-Fi password for the <laughs> oh, media members? Awesome. I did see that. Jordan pushed off. I love I'm that. I'm like, get over it, my God. I, I love how you're worried about it being an early morning. Like, people have anything to do in Salt Lake. Everything closes at 9 o'clock. Everyone's got to well, be in bed by 1030. Come on. Yeah, maybe I'm speaking for Utah <laughs> as a whole, but with how BYU played yesterday, they looked like they were asleep oh, for about half of that we game. So, as Andy said, Northwestern FAU, get things started here at 12.15 today. Plenty, plenty of boiler talk. And day one recap, the hero that is Jack Golke. Thank you, Mr. Golke. I cannot be happy. Honestly, if we have a third kid, Golke Bowen <laughs> might, might, might be the route that we pursue here in the Bowen household. Good Friday morning to you. Thanks for spending it with us. It is the Wake Up Call, 93.5, 107.5, The Fan. Soccer Saturday.
It's the Wake Up Call with KB and Andy on 93.5 and 107.5. The Fan. Reminder, coming up in about 20 minutes, Greg Rakestraw will join us. We'll talk a bunch of brackets with him, uh, what he saw in the high school ranks and everything in between. Bruce Weber going to join us coming up at 8.30. Uh, you know, Coach Weber, boy, he's been on the good side. He's been on the heartbreaking side of what uh, uh, some of the coaches are feeling, uh, like a John Calipari uh, and everybody else. Now, KB, where are you doing the show today? We know you're in Nash- beautiful Nashville, Indiana, but where are you at? Like uh, you in a your log cabin or where exactly are you doing the show? Yeah, we've got an Airbnb. Um, just yeah, I mean, just off like the main street area here. I mean, it's Nashville, Indiana. Okay. It's not like there's a ton of different, uh, you know, civilization type of roads and anything. But yeah, do you I'm have the BP in gas bathroom. station in your in your vicinity? You can see it. It's a good question. I cannot see the BP gas station. Okay. I didn't realize there's an indoor water park down here. Did you know that? Yes, I have. I, Three kids, yes. You're damn right I know there's an indoor water <laughs> I was going to say, yes. if anyone times. knew it, it'd, it'd be you. Yeah, Abe Martin Lodge. Oh. Um, so I don't know if we're going to dabble over there a little bit later today or not. Uh, Ms. make sure the kids have all their shots before they get in that water. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, that is uh, that is well said. A uh, couple different yeah. things. If you're watching on the YouTube stream, Mark Dykton did put up a picture of UKB. He has oh the uh, he has uh, he has the he has the before picture on uh, WeGrowHairIndy.com. Yeah. So that's what he has popping right oh, now. Oh, nice! Check so, out the yeah, MVP page. Right and, yeah, yeah, he checked out the page, and so uh, he has that. You know, we have we have we have several minutes here to talk about Purdue. You know, I'm just wondering. Uh, you know, I, I've always told you guys, and I know you, we talked about this off air that, you know, Purdue were to lose this weekend. We know what Monday and Tuesday are going to be about. And I know uh, you and Jake had to do that show. And, uh, you know, even the last couple of years, Purdue in the NCAA tournament, whether it be Elite Eight heartbreak or exiting, you know, much too early out of the NCAA tournament always gets people riled up and rightfully so. And so, you know, with me, you know, watching, it was interesting for me from afar, not following Kentucky this year to watch them and to watch Calipari flounder yet again in the tournament and to watch, you know, their team, which is uber talented. It's much different than Purdue's, but it's uber talented. And so for me, I was watching Kentucky and I'm like, big picture is there is no big picture. Cal's only going to walk away if Cal wants to walk away and leave $30, $40 million on the table. And he's not going to do that. And they can't fire him. And everyone's just kind of stuck. They're just kind of in a pattern that is stuck. And so they hate their coach there in Lexington. I mean, they don't like him. I mean, they don't. They they, they don't believe in him, and they're ready for him to move on, and they want to go get a Scott Drew or somebody else. I'm trying to figure out. I know Purdue fans may not like this. Listen, I am hoping Purdue – I want to be clear – I am hoping they make a I hope they win it all. I mean, it would be a great story from the bed that they have made to the nonsense they have dealt with, you know, to go and to get that big payoff for Matt Painter and Zach Eady and the great team and great teams, quite frankly, that they've put together. We know the positive side. If they make that run to Phoenix, we know what kind of jubilation and validation and all of these different things will go in to the Purdue program. I guess for me, I, I, I'm asking the question, I'm kind of answering it as well, but what's at stake here for Purdue? In, in other words, right now, Matt Painter has very much the – He's a damn good coach, but we're a little bit worried about him when we get to the NCAA tournament. You know, Matt Painter's much like John Calipari. Maybe he's not going anywhere. You don't want, I mean, Purdue fans don't want him to go anywhere. But when you lose in March in these one game situations, uh, the way you develop, the way you coach, the way you run a program, everything gets brought up and questioned when you lose, especially if you're Purdue being so damn good in the regular season, you're going to be the favorite, right? You're going to lose to someone who is considered lesser than you. And so I am interested, if I'm a Purdue fan today, 
I'm wondering if there is a consensus of what is at stake because this is the last great run you have with an alien. And his name's Zach Eady. You don't get seven, five guys that you can pencil in for 25 points and 10, 15 rebounds every single night. Yeah, I, I think Matt Painter's honestly said it. It's it's legacy. It's what separates you from great and then great in all caps. I mean, it's it's the difference in, you know, they, you know, whatever, honoring you at a game and, you know, throwing you up in the rafters to putting your name on the court or building a statue out front of Mackey Arena of you. I mean, it, it, it's that sort of stuff of this is how college basketball operates. You know, I mean, there are you know, Bob Knight won three national titles. I mean, that that's what has separated him um, and, and put him in that rare, rare air to use the Jim Mercer phrase. Um, so that's what is at stake for, you know, not only Matt Painter, but certainly Zach Eady as well. Uh, and again, I think Matt Painter has not been afraid to acknowledge that in that it's it is extremely, extremely remarkable what Purdue has done here over the last couple. The undefeated non-conferences. I mean, look at the final AP poll this year. I think they played seven teams in the top 20, six of them away from home, and they won all those games. I mean, that's that's absurd for a team to do that. It's what hap- hasn't happened since we looked it up, 75-76 Hoosiers. The last time a team's won the Big Ten by you know multiple games in consecutive seasons. So they're doing stuff that we just haven't really seen, to be totally honest with you. But ultimately... Um, if you want to compare it to golf, it, it's a little bit like, okay, you can pad your stats a little bit with all these other tournaments, but at the end of the day, right. Get it with uh, the, masters. the master stands yeah. above the rest and yeah. the majors stand above the rest. And that is what Purdue will enter tonight at 725. I thought Matt Painter was very honest yesterday, even though, uh, he didn't initially love the question on, you know, what is it going to take to get on a run to the final four? And he laid out three things that, you know, two of them, I think we've really talked about, the other one is a little bit more of a – it's a stat that I like to go to and kind of pick in my bracket, to be honest with you. He, he basically pointed out we got to take care of the basketball. Certainly we've hammered that. Uh, his second thing was you got to make your free throws. Um, they've been kind of like middle of the pack, a little bit better than middle of the pack this year in free throw percentage. Uh, certainly they get to the line a ton. And then lastly, his exact phrase was, We've got to be grimy on defense. <laughs> I like that. And obviously, it's kind of hard to measure that. But, Andy, when I hear that, it goes back to the mud analogy I've, I've been making with Purdue. Of, like, last year in that game against Fairleigh Dickinson, I didn't think they wanted to play in the mud. And you're going to have to have – I'm not asking Purdue to go out there and hold, you know, these opponents to 56 and 58. Um, but you, you, you've got to get those timely, timely stops. The turnover thing. You know, the stats obviously bear it out of, you know, again, 13 turnovers or less. Um, that's that's the magical number. They've been uh, they're undefeated last year. I think they were 22 and two. Uh, and then when it rises above that, that's when you run into issues. So, again, uh, to your first question, it's it's legacy. It's what ultimately defines you. And again, if you want the statue, if, you know, you want things to be named after you, per se, and you want to talk about Zach Eady as un, you know, undoubtedly one of the greatest, really, college basketball players of all time. Not just Purdue greats, because he is that. But if you want to talk about him as one of the greatest college basketball players of all time, the team success has got to be there, right or wrong. Yeah, and think, and think about this as well. And Purdue fans know this. Like, I, I'm making the analogy with Kentucky and Calipari because there is frustration there. And if Purdue were to stumble, especially this weekend or even early next weekend, we know what the conversation would be. The thing is, KB, you can only do, I don't want to call it an excuse, but you can only use a narrative I feel like kind of once. And Purdue has had to bend the knee and kind of do this. We're going to sit in it and we're going to learn from it. And and kind of they've had that message for 365 days. And I think the Purdue fan has been a, a, a little bit accepting of that, especially when they knew Edie was going to be back and so many of the key pieces. And then you add a Lance Jones and you were never worried about a Braden Smith transferring or something like that and making the jump from freshman to sophomore years when guys make a jump. And so you lost last year, but you were able to immediately pivot 
to the next team and understand that, hey, we're going to win a crap ton of games. In the, we're going to win the Big Ten again, and we're going to be all right there as a one or two seed and everything else. And all that is great, but you can't – I think what's at stake here is you can't do that again. Does that make sense? Like, you can't go through another offseason where we sit here and Matt Painter has to answer the questions about sitting in it for another year until we get to March Madness. Like, if they don't get the monkey off their back this year, that is something that is going to grow on this program and is going to almost, like, I would worry it would infest the program a little bit. It would be who they are, and that's not who they are. Who they are is, they win all these games. I mean, they have 20 quad one and quad two wins this year, KB. And that number is going to grow. If they go in the tournament, they're going to end up with 22, 23, 24, 25 wins. And, you know, maybe they got to make the final four. Maybe for, you know, most fans, they got to go win the national title. And all these are not easy things to do. But I am interested in narratives and big, big picture narratives. And, and I happen to think this NCAA tournament is going to set up so many narratives about this Purdue basketball team, good or bad. Yeah, and, and I think and this is going to be hard to evaluate tonight. But again, I put so much of this on how does Matt Painter mentally get this team ready and how do they react to the moment? I go back to last year against Fairleigh Dickinson, and it is just amazing to see that game play out. And Purdue gets in the bonus like they always seemingly do. It's one of their greatest strengths. They get in the bonus in the first half of the second half. Um, here you go. Foul a bunch of dudes out. We see it seemingly every game with Purdue. And Andy, from the 9-25 mark of the second half last year against Fairleigh Dickinson, Zach Eady makes a bucket. Yep. They don't attempt another two-point shot from 9-25 to 20 seconds to go in the game. And they're in the bonus. I mean, it's clank after clank after clank. It's turnover after turnover. It was break the press and then stand out there by midcourt until right. the shot clock's like at 10 right. and then try to do something. Like, and that's where, I, I, it, to me, it's just so much more mentally of, and it's a team that you've watched them react to all these different situations. ED on the floor, ED off the floor, foul trouble, Maui, Arizona at Gamebridge Fieldhouse, road games in the Big Ten. They've responded from every loss this year in emphatic fashion. You know, certainly we'll find out tonight a little bit more of that. But to me, so much of this just comes back to mentally. How do they just react to the one-and-done nature of these moments? I mean, it's not like Jack Golke makes 10 threes every game for Oakland. I mean, he's yes, he's a great shooter, but last night, I mean, the dude didn't even start last night for Oakland. <laughs> if he was some you know, Again, unbelievable got, he dead the, eye. He has the Wolverine haircut. It needs to be said. That's what he has. He's got the Wolverine haircut. He looks like <laughs> Steve Alford's you know, stepson, something like that. I mean, it is just a it, – it, it, it's unbelievable to – see what the one and done nature of March can do to people. And I think Purdue felt that last season. So, you know, for me, sure, there's X's and O's elements to it. And, you know, Purdue shot the ball much, much better. But it's just that thousand pound piano. You know, yeah, how do they is. react to that? Hey. It, that's the unknown of it all, and that's the beauty and the beast of March Madness. It's the only thing you can't practice. We got to go to break here, but you know, teams like Creighton and teams like Illinois, they, they felt that game pressure, did they not? I mean, I mean, Illinois, uh, that that game was tied at forty eight with fourteen minutes left. Illinois went on a thirty three to ten run in that game and so yeah Purdue that's you know it's almost like it's weird for us we won't have a show on Saturday I feel like these discussions are for Saturday does that make sense like it's like to right, me right, to yes, me it's not yes, for tonight yeah, I mm-hmm. think they win 95 yeah. 65 you know tonight Again, I am curious to see the health of Braden Smith tonight because you know I think you can survive tonight certainly with whatever 80 percent whatever you want to label him at but certainly I don't think you can move on really out of the weekend unless you get him much closer to 100%. So much more on the Boilers throughout the show. Again, high energy Friday. Bruce Weber going to join us coming up 8.30. Lynn Dunn. We'll try to sneak in a Caitlin Clark question or two to Lynn Dunn. She joins us coming up at 9.30. On the other side, plenty of Indiana flavor to yesterday's start to March Madness. The state had some guys that you might not realize are from Indiana. No one better to talk to about that than Greg Rakestraw. He joins us next. 93.5 and 107.5 The Fan. Your home.
It's the Wake Up Call with KB and Andy on 93.5 and 107.5. The Fan. Hour number two, KB and Andy, Wake Up Call, hanging out with you. DriveHubler.com studios. Reminder, all the games get going again at 12.15 today. What a game, or uh, what a what a night of games, a day of games, I should say, yesterday, NCAA tournament. Nothing better than that. Reminder, also, coming up in about a half an hour, Bruce Weber going to join us. We'll talk some brackets with him and much more. You know, it's a Friday at 8 o'clock. Let's go on out. Pay less liquors hotline. Greg Rakes are all joining us here. Uh, on the wake up call on this Friday, Rake. A good morning to you. Uh, any first day of the NCAA tournament impressions? Uh, anything you watched yesterday, last night that you found interesting? Maybe besides Kentucky gagging away their season for the fourth straight season. I was going to say now, obviously, with your background, you think of Kentucky first. With my background, I think of Oakland first. And I acknowledge when we can get to talking about John Calipari if you want to. I certainly understand that but i have known greg campy dating back to when i was a junior in college and i like the man despite the fact that he ruined my spring break my junior year (laughs) because oakland's last division two season was 1997 when my university of indianapolis greyhounds were the number one seed in our region and they came in and beat us in the regional semifinals. but then the next year oakland goes division one at the same time as iupui which means I spent a lot of time in the arena, their basketball gymnasium slash arena, that is built to be a modern take on Nickerson Hall from the University of Indianapolis. And now these days, we're doing the Horizon League show, I get to know coaches and players a little bit better. But I have literally known Campy for a quarter of a century. So having seen an Oakland team play multiple times this year and having known Greg the way that I do, I am so happy for him, for that school, For the Horizon League, which made a pretty big jump forward as a league this year, it paid off in terms of getting that win against Kentucky. So there's a lot of storylines you can go to, whether it's Keith Dambrot winning at Duquesne, their first tournament win since the 60s. There's a local tie there, too. His son, Robbie, played for us on the Indy 11 the last couple of years. So I I know the family there. Uh, There's a personal tie there for me. But all in all, I mean, my goodness, it's it's. It's the first day of college basketball, and let me take a a sidestep here. Kevin has to be just a participant for the next 30 seconds. Andy, if I could say if there was one quintessential place to have a meal, given yours and my uh, upbringing in similar parts of this state, if there was one restaurant that you go, man, I miss this back home, what would it be? Oh, goodness. You're putting me on the spot. Okay, so my, mine's, a, mine's a pizza place. Have you ever been to New Albanian Pizza? Of course I have. It's, it's tremendous. Yeah, it's tremendous. This place, th- th- this place has a little more, I wouldn't say, I mean, legacy. Okay. Um, um, but, and, it's, and, and it tried to expand, but now I think it's back to being a Southern Indiana and Louisville thing. So it's like something you appreciate oh, goodness. if you have the chance to go oh, back what, home. What, I was, what is it? I was what hanging is it? around State Street in New Albany yesterday, Andy. Where might I have gone? Oh, goodness. State Street uh, wasn't sushi, was it? What is it? I feel terrible. What is it? I'm an idiot. I can't believe this. Well, Help me. I'm, I'm surprised that you don't have a greater knowledge of the no. weed, Andy, on multiple fronts. Tumbleweed was what I had for lunch <laughs> oh, yesterday, goodness. Andy. You had tumbleweed yesterday? I have been to a tumbleweed in, uh, in quite a while. I do remember, and KB, you'll love this. They used to have the margarita nights. Remember that? The margarita nights, the dollar, two dollar margaritas. I, I was there for the queso. The margaritas were a wonderful side benefit, Andy. Yeah, I'm sure they were. Well, good I for you, Ray. I can do a margarita. Yeah, certainly here on a Friday. Ray, but you guys, you this is your your end of the week is in two hours. I think you officially hit margarita territory at eight oh five. I think <laughs> yeah, you're safe. No, no doubt. Certainly on day two of the tournament, Ray. I thought you'd also be the perfect person. I, I obviously rich history, Horizon League, Greg Campy. Uh, you know, great friend of Ron Hunter, dating back to the IPY days, certainly. Yep. Uh, what do you know about Jack Golke's previous stop <laughs> of his Hillsdale College? They're not GLVC, right? They're not in UND's league? Correct, but but UND views them as one of their chief kind of rivals or an institution that's very similar to them. So Jack played at, at Hillsdale, as you mentioned, which is in the GMAC, which is in the Great Midwest Athletic Conference and just across the state line. But after five years there, and because of, of COVID and redshirt, et cetera, you know, years are kind of fungible, at least for another year or two in, in college athletics. So he is in his sixth collegiate season. 
And we, as an IUPUI, played Oakland at home early to mid-January. And I I noticed the amount of three-pointers that he took for Oakland uh, during the course of the season. And at that time, he was averaging taking a three-pointer every three minutes. He played about 31 minutes a game, mostly off the bench. Uh, So he played like a starter. He's actually the sixth man of the league in the Horizon League this year. And his job was to take threes. It's a great job if you can get it. Obviously, last night, he fired 20 of them and made half of them. I actually had a chance to interview him for the On the Horizon weekly show that we did on the fan leading up to the uh, Barbasol basketball championships a a couple of weeks back. Uh, Really well put together individual. Uh, He's trying to figure out whether he's going to follow his business degree or try to play professionally past this point. Uh, my th- my thought is last night's game probably helped him steer him for the ladder at least for a little while because that name is going to resonate with basketball fans. This is his one shining moment. This is his 50 minutes of fame. And if they're not a Cinderella, maybe they can extend it coming up on Saturday. Well, and Rake, you know this better than anybody. The crazy thing about them is they've got the other kid that can shoot it. I, I mean, he's not, not the volume of goalkey, but Blake Lampin, the other guard, right. He chucks it and throws it in the ocean more often than not. I mean, like, he's a high-level shooter, and, and their best player is Trey Townsend. And, you know, Greg Campy was on with Jake and Jimmy after winning the Horizon League, or it, it might have been the day of the championship game. He's like, Trey Townsend's going to be playing at a power five. I mean, he's going to be a portal kid coming up because, you know, he had 38 points in our conference championship game. Yeah, and, and Trey's unique story, too. So, Trey, and this spans the amount of time that Greg has been at Oakland. Greg was the head coach there starting in 1984. Greg coached Trey's dad at Oakland University, like in the late 80s. So it's a Trey great story. grew up going to basketball camps at Oakland and was a walk-on at Oakland before earning a scholarship. So this is also, and we've talked about this, this is not exactly new, but the last two or three years is that, you know, you have these teams with a lot of guys that are, you know, 23 24 years old and that's kind of this Oakland team they really are there there's I'm trying to think if there's freshmen that get playing time on that team in their rotation I don't think so it's primarily fourth fifth and sixth year players on that team that's a men's league team they know exactly what to do Townsend is part of that as well the best part about Townsend's game to me is that if they need him to take over he will but he also has no problem deferring to a Lampman to a goalkey, uh, to a, 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 a DQ Cole, who's one of the top junior college players in the country last year and now has, has a key role on, on that Oakland team. Um, it, it's just a good, skilled team. They had the best win in the league in terms of non-conference games. They won at Xavier at the end of November, and because of their experience, just kind of felt that maybe this was the year that a Horizon League team got a victory. And, uh, and because of NCAA tournament units, that benefits every Horizon League member. They all made more money with that win from Oakland last night. Greg Rakestraw with us here on the Payless Liquors Hotline. One last thing on this. I was trying to find the tweet from last night on Golkey, but it was it was hilarious. Like his high school team, they knocked Tyler Hero's high school team out of the state <laughs> championship, and now he knocks Kentucky out of the NCAA tournament. Meanwhile, Tyler Hero's finishing up his fifth year in the NBA. <laughs> That's how long this guy's been around. You know, Hero's finishing up uh, his fifth year in the NBA. So an unbelievable story and an unbelievable day of college basketball gets going again today at 12-15. Uh, Purdue, obviously right down the road here, Greg. Uh, Purdue has been the story, and for a year they have they've bent the knee. They've sat in it. They said all the right things about what happened last year in the NCAA tournament. What is your confidence meter on this team making a deep run here in March as they begin things tonight? against Grambling State? Confidence meter tonight is exceedingly high. Um, Confidence meter in Indianapolis, I think, is high. Confidence meter in terms of the experience, the skill set of this team is very high. Recent history and just that whole not being in a Final Four in 44 years is is what concerns you. Um, Again, you're trying to flip the script on a couple of different generations of can't believe we lost that sweet 16 game in 88. Can't believe they didn't beat Wisconsin in 2000. 
can't believe they can't believe they barely beat a 16 seed as a one back in 1996. I can't believe they got beat by Little Rock and North Texas and St. Peter's and FDU. So, it, so you know some of that has to do with this team. Most of it doesn't. You know, so you've got to find a way if you're the Boilermakers to use last year as the proper motivation to unleash the beast in tonight's game. But frankly, don't think about everything that came before you. Just go play the game. Because clearly, over the course of the last three years, in terms of just playing the game, you you don't get past one hand in counting the teams that have been as good over that three-year period as the Oh, we might have and oh, fire you up for tonight. You go do it. Other than that, you try to block that out as best you possibly can. He is Greg Regstra. This segment presented by CarX. Obviously, high school state finals uh, coming up next weekend with Gamebridge Fieldhouse occupied here. Uh, coming up tonight and Sunday with the NCAA tournament. Regstra with us here on the Payless Liquors Hotline. Just to add one more thing on Jack Golkey, by the way, guys, he's three months older than Tyrese Halliburton. <laughs> If you want to go down that path, uh, Rake, you were texting with me. I want to say it was yesterday. I don't know. All the days run together at this point, but I love your NCAA tournament indie nuggets. You just shared the Keith Dambrot indie eleven one with our audience. I'll throw a couple more at you, and feel free to chime in with any more because just I, I just eat them up. Um, if you look at last night, or you look at even tonight. Grambling State's got two kids from the state, Jalen Johnson yep. from Manuel. Uh, Dante Jackson said to us, kind of their, their, their sixth man, he got some big minutes late. Uh, Jermaine Kuznard had 40 yesterday for Oregon. He hails from East Chicago, and I know he's a little banged up with an ankle injury, but NC State's got Jaden Taylor. I kind of forgot the Perry Meridian Butler transfer there. Um, he, he didn't. I don't think he scored actually coming off the bench for them, but he's been a nice player for him this season. India, any other Indiana-related nuggets from some of these teams alive in the tournament? Well, obviously, you've got Christian Lander and Brandon Newman that we'll see at Western Kentucky. Um, if, if you look at Marquette, uh, if he gets in the game, this is a good sign. Jonah Lucas uh, from Harrison High School, whose dad, Perel is one of the best players in the history of the University of Indianapolis. He's a walk-on that Marquette team. Uh, I, I think per capita, I think we're second in terms of states with players playing in the NCAA tournament, that stat is skewed a bit because you've got both Nebraska and Creighton that made the NCAA tournament. So there's, there's a handful of walk-ons from Nebraska playing for those local schools that, uh, that, that made the tournament. I think we're fifth in terms of just simply total numbers of players. So even though it's not exactly a great showing, and it clearly should have been better, in terms of Indiana teams playing in the NCAA tournament, um, the sun never sets on the Indiana basketball empire. Let's put it that way. And in terms of Jalen Johnson, Jalen played in, in, in our league, as in the Horizon League last year. He played in Milwaukee last year. And um, I'm not sure the time exists to research this stat, but I would assume that he will hold the NCAA mark for this season for having played his high school games as close to the arena in which he is playing in the NCAA tournament, being a manual alum, what is that, a mile and a half to get from Gamebridge to manual high school? <laughs> so I, I think he hold, holds the proximity lead for the entirety of the NCAA tournament this year. Yeah, it's a great story there. Dante Jackson getting some ties to Wisconsin, Milwaukee, and a couple of Indiana kids that will be facing Purdue tonight. Okay, last one for me, Rake, and I do want to give a shout-out to my good buddy Dan Casaro because he was texting me yesterday with a thought to save the NIT it had me thinking I like the outside of the box thought process don't see it coming to fruition but I'll toss it your way rake he says this you give the winner of the NIT an automatic spot in the play-in game the next year for the NCAA tournament it won't happen but I like the idea here is the precedent to know how big of a soccer guy you are. So the precedent for that would be the winner of the Europa League, mm -hmm. which is the second continental European tournament, gets a spot in the Champions League the next year. And since maybe the best model for college athletics that's, that's happening now 
would be the Champions League. You know, like the Big Ten would be the Premier League. You know, La Liga would be the Big 12. Uh, you know, SEC would be the Bundesliga, something along those lines. I know I've lost most of you at this point in time, and the soccer nerds are laughing hysterically, you know, as, as, as I bring this up. So uh, I like the idea. It's probably not going to happen. Um, in terms of the NIT, since they had so many teams decline this year, they actually had to invite an under 500 team in Xavier to play in it. Perhaps, perhaps what we do is stop screwing the mid majors and guarantee the bids like they had done for most of the last 20 years, to where if you won your league regular season but didn't win the league re- the, the, the tournament, you still had a bid in the NIT. So I don't get why they went away to play. That. Perhaps we go and do that, but again, usually, despite their continued level of success in the NCAA tournament. Uh, the folks that have the office uh, just across the street from Victory Field tend not to legislate to, to benefit the low to mid majors all that much. That probably won't happen either. He's presented by CarX. His name is Greg Rakestra. He joins us here on the Payless Liquors Hotline. Uh, all right. Well, I mean, even though they have a week off, uh, I'd be remiss not to ask you high school action. You were following it all last weekend. And, boy, my Jeff Red Devils almost made it to state. It was so close. We talked about that even off air. But uh, you look at, at least on 4A, Fishers and Ben Davis make it out. And then I know you followed all the way from 3 to 2 to 1A as well. What stood out uh, for you? you and now uh, the guys get a week off and we get things popping again next weekend well I think Jeff was clearly um, you know the the big story of last weekend in terms of nearly knocking off LN and Ben Davis you know in in the same day Uh, and and you've heard me be high on your team um, you know all of the season Uh, I didn't think they'd beat LN if they'd hang with them uh, but clearly had the right game plan I think Sharon Wilkerson does a tremendous job from a coaching standpoint from a game plan standpoint Jeff brings back all the kids that played last week heavy minutes other than their point guard. Uh, they also had a young man that was hurt in February. It was really kind of their fifth starter, but still an extra piece you didn't see the last five or six weeks of the season. If Jeff can keep all those kids together, they're one of the top five teams in the state next year. They're a really good basketball team. Ben Davis played a flawless game against Center Grove and then had to kind of kick it in the last couple of minutes to find a way back to beat Jeff. But that Fishers-Ben Davis game that's the finale next week, they played each other the first night of the regular season. Fishers won that game, but there's a big asterisk there. A, it's four months ago. But B, Mark Zachary, who has been tremendous the last couple of weeks for BD and really the last three years at Ben Davis, did not play in that game because, well, Ben Davis was still playing their football season. They played in the state championship four days after Fishers and Ben Davis played. So when I see those two teams, I see a lot of similarities as in there's not a defined star. It is very much a team effort. It is very much a well-coached effort. I think the 4A game is going to be tremendous. Uh, I, I think three of the four games are going to be really good. The other story that I want to make sure that I mention, though, just because they're 1A, they tend to get overlooked, and because they have not had a great tournament tradition, even though they're just across the county line, Bethesda Christian is really good in 1A, and, and they will be – should be maybe the biggest favorite of, of, of the four games going in just because seemingly most of the ranked teams in 1A were in the southern half of the bracket. They will take on Canterbury of Fort Wayne because, again, of Fort Wayne, Canterbury plays a pretty good schedule, as does Bethesda with being based here in Brownsburg, you know, in, in the Indianapolis area. But for Bethesda Christian to win against Bar Reeve at the Hatchet House, which is, is the equivalent of a road win to win their semi-state final, where Bar Reeve is literally seven minutes from the Hatchet House in downtown Washington, and they won handily. Bethesda Christian is really good. So if you're going to the morning session, plenty of great storylines. The Wapahani Brownstown Central, I think, is going to be really good. Uh, I, I think the South Bend St. Joe, Statsburg game has a lot of talent on the floor, a lot of size on the floor for 3A teams that catches your attention. But uh, from a local standpoint, Bethesda Christian and both 4A teams, uh, certainly worth your interest next Saturday at GameBridge. You'll get some Purdue flavor tonight inside of GameBridge Fieldhouse, and you'll get it also next Saturday, or I guess late morning, early afternoon, as Rake said, Brownstown Central. Jack Benter, 38 in the semi-state championship game. Uh, He will be a part of that 2A, one versus two there from GameBridge Fieldhouse coming up 
next Saturday. Rake, as always, man, you're an encyclopedia. Cannot thank you enough. You got it, fellas. We'll talk next week. That is Greg Rakestraw right there on the Payless Liquors Hotline in less than 10 minutes. Bruce Weber going to join us. We thought certainly the Purdue ties speak for themselves with Bruce Weber. Always love hearing him chat. And, you know, if he were in Matt Painter's shoes, how would he be handling things coming up tonight in this tournament run with certainly so much on the line for the Boilermakers? Bruce Weber going to join us in a few. Before that, let's hit a morning check down. The Morning Checkdown, brought to you by the National Invitation Tournament. Experience basketball's beginning with the NIT. Coming to Hinkle Fieldhouse April 2nd and 4th. All right, let's get your Morning Checkdown popping. It is Purdue and Grambling State, the one in the 16. They face off tonight, 725 there at Game Bridge. We'll see if the if the early session goes long. They may move it back a few minutes, but that is said to be 725 on TBS. In all, Matt Painter, happy to be a one seed, happy to be playing right here in Indy. It is pretty cool for us to be a one seed last year and then to fight to get back here to be a one seed and to be able to play in Indianapolis and to play in front of your fans. So, um, but we got to do our part, right? I always say that when you have a good fan base or, you, you know, you have a full house, you know, you, you, you still have to play well for that to be an advantage. If you don't play well, they're not an advantage because they have nothing to cheer about. So, you know, we're hoping to do our job and give them a lot to cheer about. Obviously, Purdue favored. It opened, we talked about this, KB, at 25 and a half. Purdue now favored by 27 and a half. The over-under at 138 and a half. If you want to bet uh, Purdue on the money line, it's minus 7,500. Grambling State plus 2,000 <laughs> on the betting line. Again, coming up 725 tonight, Grambling State and Purdue. And again, the only real question for me with Purdue tonight, um, probably a little bit more mentally, but I do think just, you know, how does Braden Smith look? Nine of 33 the last three games, a couple of injuries in there. Uh, certainly he is vital to any deep run here in March, but I think I speak for all Purdue fans in just get us to the damn game. Enough, enough, enough. Get us to 725, and like you said, probably more like 745 coming up tonight inside of Gamebridge Fieldhouse. All right, speaking of the Fieldhouse, the Pacers uh, usually call that place home. They're out west, 10 o'clock tip with Golden State tonight. The Warriors are actually favored by four and a half. I say actually Golden State has not won back-to-back games all month. Um, They're trying to do that here tonight. The Pacers have won four straight on the road all by double digits. Again, Steph Curry back from that ankle injury looking just fine. Trace Jackson Davis playing and producing at a very consistent level. Off the bench right now, Obi Toppin is questionable for this one with a left ankle sprain. So again, it'll be tonight, Golden State, Saturday, or excuse me, Sunday, Lakers, Monday, Clippers, the final back-to-back of the year. Of course, no travel between the two L.A. opponents, and the Pacers will round out this five-game road trip in Chicago on Wednesday. Yeah, the uh, the only other thing I had before we get Bruce Weber, I mean, this is it is big news. We'll have to see how much Mike Woodson puts around him, but Malik Renew is back, so we know for sure uh, Malik Renew is back. Trey Galloway, Anthony Leal, I don't think any surprise there, but making that official yesterday, big man uh, Malik Renew be back for his junior season in Bloomington. Yeah, one thing I'll add to Andy, plenty of bracket talks upcoming. Did see Julian Blackman, Colt Safety, visiting the 49ers. So he is starting to make the rounds. Buffalo and now San Francisco again. What's the market? What does Julian Blackman think his market is? I think that is probably the holdup right now. And a player that certainly went healthy is extremely, extremely quality and extremely important uh, to the Colts. And so i uh, be curious to see how that safety position Evolves for Indianapolis. Again, I still think a veteran safety, a veteran corner is a must here this offseason. All right, coming up next, the great Bruce Weber. He joins us to talk brackets, talk boilers. Got an emergency on the weekend? We're here for you at BW Plumbing Heating.
It's the Wake Up Call with KB and Andy on 93.5 and 107.5. The Fan. Yeah, appreciate you joining us. If you miss any of Greg Rakestraw, any of our conversations, always check out the podcast center. You can do so 1075thefan.com, wherever you download your podcast, rewatch the YouTube stream as well. Appreciate you making us a part of your morning. Let's keep the, the college basketball and the March Madness conversation going. We'll go on out to the Payless Liquors Hotline. The great Bruce Weber joining us here on the program. Coach, thank you so much for carving out some time this morning. We'll dive into more produce specific stuff here in just a second but you know whether it be Matt Painter last year maybe even Tommy Lloyd last year definitely John Calipari last night just from a coach's viewpoint I know you've been there what are these coaches like Cal going through when they exit you know stage left last night and Oakland does the unthinkable of 14 beats of three what's going through a coach's mind when that happens well it's I guess it would be a disaster. Um, it, it's hard. I mean, you you work all year. Uh, when you have a t- good team and you think you have a chance to, to be successful and then the craziness of March Madness hits, um, it, it, it's tough. I, I listened to Coach Calipari's interview last night, and I thought he did a great job, but you know it's just killing you inside. And, you know, I, I've dealt with it. I, you know, I – talked to Matt Painter last year quite a bit after the tournament and and it's just not easy because you start doubting yourself and could you have done this could you have done that and sometimes it's just hey they made 15 threes and (laughs) and it didn't really matter what you do and it's just part of March Madness and that's why it's one of the most exciting sporting events in the in the country in the world. He is Bruce Weber. He's with us here on the Pay Less Liquors Hotline. Coach, I do want to get back to Purdue for just a second. You mentioned those conversations with Matt Painter. What have you thought about, you know, Matt's, he's kind of the full-on embrace of it. We're going to sit in it. You know, I think he could opt for the, oh, that was last year's team. We're not talking about that anymore. And he's chosen to go down a different path. How have you thought about how he has kind of gone about the Fairleigh Dickinson loss and then, do you almost look at it if you were coaching Purdue tonight and you think it's almost more mental than it is physical uh, considering the questions they continually get asked? Well, I think it's, it's more the players being focused and ready to play. And, and again, I, I talked about it last year. You know, I don't think Matt got enough credit for what he did with that. You know, it, the, right now in college basketball, it's get old as a team and stay old. And, and they were, pretty much relatively young when you had two freshman guards starting and um, you know, it was, it just was a tough situation and, and they win the league and, and win by a good margin in the league. And, and, you know, and then the craziness happened and, you know, I guess those guys weren't ready for it. And I think it's, it, it's not always a recipe, uh, to being successful in the NCAA, to have that experience. But most of the time, if you can have some NCAA games under your belt or your team have quite a few of them, especially at the guard position, it helps. So now they're your older, um, I, you know, I think they're better as a team. I know they're better. I mean, you could see it. Um, and then obviously hand, hand, also adding Lance Jones to the mix and Braden Smith's improvement is is astronomical, and so now you have better guard play, you have a, a better defense, and and they're just a smarter team. If they just come focus and and play the game the right way, I think it'll you know they'll be fine tonight against Grambling, and I really think they're going to be okay even against you know whether it's TCU, Utah State. Um, you know, moving forward. And then it get you get to the 16 and anything can happen. Then it's, you know, the, you got all really good teams for the most part. And you're going to have to just make sure you have, you're playing your be- best basketball at the right time. Obviously, you see him on Big Ten Network, a man that's won 15 NCAA tournament games. Bruce Weber with us here on the Payless Liquors Hotline. Coach, you are a longtime coach, so certainly many, many years in the Midwest. Uh, did your paths ever cross with Greg Campy, who seems like quite the character? Yes, he is quite the character. I've known him for a long time. Um, you know, I was probably, he's 40 years right at, at Oakland, and 
I had started at uh, Purdue 40, whatever it is, 44, 45 years ago. And um, so as he came through, I definitely, we played him. I don't know if you remember we when I was at Illinois, it was the game we played with the women's ball by a mistake for about eight minutes of the game. And, <laughs> and he still uses it as the punchline of, and they were winning the game. And then five, our players kept complaining to me, coach, something's wrong with the ball. And I said, they're making shots. You just start making shots. And and finally, I think at the second TV timeout, I don't know, one of the officials said, this is the wrong ball. We got a women's ball. And, and <laughs> we went and changed, and we went on the run. So Coach, coach Campy's used that one as a punchline many times in his in his since that time, and uh, you know, just uh, you know, he as you said, a character. He's fun loving. I mean, to stay at one place, um, he's had pretty good success. It's, he plays a really tough schedule, and he plays that zone. And it's always put, tough to play him. I, I had their game against Michigan State a year ago, and they, you know, it was not an easy game for Michigan State. And I and I watched their game against Illinois this year. I think it was Ohio State this year or last year. They played them close. And so they get that experience of playing some pretty good schedule, and, and they were up to the task. And obviously last night they were, you know, when you start making threes like that and one guy makes ten of them, it's, it's a special moment. Uh, what do you say, Bruce Weber with us, what do you say as a coach when you can sense and then you see a player who is just going off and, of course, uh, knocking down 10 threes last night? What do you say to your squad to implore them, hey, this guy's on fire, you need to guard him? Well, I think, you know, some of it, do you have a defensive stopper that can just say, hey, I'm going to take him out or make it tough? and. Some of them were just incredible. You know, you can't do anything about it. You just, you know, we always say, hey, smile, give him, you know, shake his hand and say, let's make the next play. But, you know, it, it, you, you got shots like that, but you got to make it tough on him and get him out of rhythm if possible. The whole thing is, do you have a defensive stopper that can do that? And, you know, Kentucky's a young team. You know, we talked about Purdue being young last year. And for the most part, they're a young team and, and, probably don't have that mindset of just, Hey, I'm somebody's going to be a defensive stopper. And I haven't followed Kentucky real close, but watching their scores, it seems like they like to score a lot of points this year and they weren't as defensive minded. And I'm not sure they had that defensive stopper could just lock somebody down. Yeah. Agree. No, there's no doubt about it. You know, usually that's the Calipari calling card is his defense. His teams understand the defense and then the offense picks it up. But this year, much different. Bruce Weber with us. Uh, we're talking Purdue and everything else, getting you ready for Purdue and Grambling State tonight uh, at 725. And he joins us here on the Payless Liquors Hotline. You know, uh, Matt Painter, Coach Painter was on with our afternoon show earlier this week, Bruce. And then he was on. Uh, he had this press conference yesterday getting ready for the game tonight and in both instances he really had a passionate speech almost about you know Zach Eady and the national perception that he is officiated differently and so what do you make of that I mean Eady is so difficult to guard almost impossible but he's also so difficult to officiate because his elbows can swing and he's seven five and he's right at the head of basically everyone who is guarding him so you know what what do you make of that as you know that could be one way that Purdue could be neutralized in this tournament is if Zach Eady's on the bench with foul trouble. Well, I, to me, it's always been over the back, and and that's the difficult thing uh, when they have struggled. Obviously, it's when they don't shoot threes, but also when Zach gets in foul trouble. And you know, throughout the year, to me, it's more the you know going over the back. Zach has become a a good offensive rebounder. He's actually become pretty smart at, you know, finding ways to get in there. He knows on ball screens, if Braden's going to shoot it, if he just follows up, it's tough to box him out because people still are in the hedges. So he's learned the game and, and, you know, it, it's, it's, he's really improved as a player, but it is a factor. And it is really, as you said it, it's really, really hard to dif- difficult to officiate the game with him. Um, you it's you who stand your ground underneath and he's just so strong and and big that you know you're going to get foul calls but they're 
there is that time where he just makes the wrong turn. The elbow goes in the wrong spot. Now he gets a quick one. Now he gets an over the back and he's out of the game. And, and that can, can be definitely be a factor for them. Uh, he did last week, put him back in against Wisconsin with two fouls in the first half. And, um, you know, so, it, or Michigan state, maybe I can't remember which game it was, but one of the two. So Matt, you know, hopefully he feels like he can trust Zach with two fouls, but anything can happen. Our national championship game, when we played Carolina, our big guy, James Augustine, you know, played eight minutes and fouled out in eight minutes. And he got his fourth foul and he hadn't played, you know, at that time, six, seven minutes. And the coaches are all saying, get him out, get him out. And I was like, you know, heck with it. He hasn't played the whole time before I could turn around. He got his fifth. So it's just, you know, it, it's part of college basketball. Um, I still have people, you know, this is whatever, almost 20 years later, they still come up to me walking through O'Hare Airport and the officiating was horrible, Coach. <laughs> the national so people still remember that. And um, you just hope it doesn't become a factor for them. Gotta love fandom. Bruce Weber with us here on the Payless Liquors Hotline. Uh, Coach, when you look at the Big Ten, we saw Michigan State advance yesterday. I want to stick on that 8-9 line. Northwestern will play the first game today. That's Florida Atlantic coming up at 12-15. Nebraska in the Trev Alberts matchup. They've got Texas A&M opposite side of the bracket, uh, 8-9 as well. So Michigan State will play UNC. Northwestern could play UConn if they win. Nebraska could play Houston if they win. Of those three Big Ten teams, Michigan State, Northwestern, Nebraska, anybody got the makeup to be playing in the Sweet 16? I got to believe Michigan State has the best chance just because they're playing the the fourth number one, I guess you would call it. And not that Carolina's not – uh, not good. I mean, they've had a great season, but to me, they're the other three are elite and uh, with Purdue, UConn and Houston. And, and that was the thing we kept talking about. And we were really hoping, uh, you know, as the big 10 network, just all the analysts, and as we talked through the, the last parts of the season and all through the tournament that we would keep our guys away, our teams away from the eight, nine, Obviously, we didn't, and it puts you in a bind because I thought the rest of the country, the twos and threes were, you know, normal basketball teams. And I and I would have thought our uh, the Big Ten representatives would have been able to compete with all of them. But to compete with Houston, UConn, it's going to be really tough. I think Michigan State will have a chance. The one thing with 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 Nebraska is that the way they play, their five out. Um, it'll be different than Houston would guard all year. Mm -hmm. They just play differently. And also on the, on the defensive end, um, you know, Nebraska plays different. So they could cause a little bit of problems. Obviously they got to get through A&M to get there, but I can, you know, I can see that Northwestern, if they had their full roster, you know, they could maybe have that crazy upset, but I just don't know if they can score enough points against UConn and if, for what Chris Collins has done with, you know, not losing just one starter, but then another starter and, and still being able to surprise, uh, sur- survive and get in the NCAA tournament, you've got to give him a lot of credit. It, it's, it's amazing what that staff has done. Coach, we'll end with this, and thank you for the time here on this Friday morning. Obviously, a portal activity has already begun in Bloomington. It does uh, it was announced yesterday Malik Renew will be back. I know there's some questions about his future entering the off season. If you had to, uh, you know, maybe rank the top three biggest portal needs for Indiana a team right now with only seven guys under scholarship for next season, where would you go? Well, I think you've got to have better guard play. And I, I mean, we've been, I've been on with you several times during the year and it, it's been the tough part uh, for them. And uh, they were able to survive. They, you know, the last time I talked to you guys, you know, they were, they were on life support and they had a great finish to the season. And again, you got to give coach Woodson some credit for some adjustments on both on the defensive end and the offensive end, obviously where decided, that he, I, I guess he's part part of it. He's healthy at that point, but 
he decided he wanted to get some attention to give himself maybe a chance for the NBA because he turned his motor on and he played at a high, high level. And, and actually, I thought Renew was probably the, one of the top one or two most improved players in the league. Um, if, he, if he can continue, they they have some, you know, obviously some presence inside, but, uh, you know, they they got to get guards. And, and that made it so tough on them. Uh, Trey Galloway, I thought, you know, was really good down the stretch. And then you have the injury, but, uh, you know, it, you got to give him some help. And that's that's going to be the key. And I just don't understand how <laughs> – I know it's all about students' rights, but this is about programs and things. I don't know how you can open the portal the week the NCAA tournament starts. Amen. And Amen. I got I, – I, I have – coaching friends that are playing in the NCAA <laughs> and they're calling me and asking me, do you have the number of this kid or that from, you know, in the past we recruited him or something. And, and uh, you know, you, you got a game to worry about. That should be your, you know, uh, 99% of your focus, not trying to see if you can get a call into a kid in the portal. So um, I hope it changes. I, and again, I'm all for student rights, but, you know, they can wait two or three weeks to start figuring out, you know, if you, you know, it, it just, to me, it's ridiculous, but, uh, you know, that's just, the whole thing is a mess and um, uh, we'll see if it's sustainable over the course of time. Yeah. I hated the news cycle earlier this week, having to share a little bit of time with the portal. So I cannot agree with you more coach on that. Again, Bruce Weber, love his analysis on big 10 network and always appreciate when he joins us. Uh, Bruce, enjoy uh, day two of the NCAA tournament. And uh, thank you as always. Very good. Good to be on. I, I think we'll be talking about Purdue for a couple of weeks and we'll see what happens. So hopefully for Matt's sake and their team's sake and all the Purdue fans, they, they have a good, good weekend here amen to that that is bruce weber right there on the pay less liquors hotline boy i think he's spot on on that portal thing i don't i don't necessarily want to you know open up a can of worms there andy because we have so much to recap from day one of the tournament but just, i mean just push uh, it a couple I weeks mean, alabama i mean alabama gotta commit we talked about this on like what tuesday alabama who is a four seed who is yet to play they play today they gotta commit and you're exactly i mean you're exactly right you say i mean all they have to do is say you can put your name in the portal but there is a no contact, no contact until you know after uh, until after the NCAA tournament, or just say we're not opening anything until the Tuesday, Thursday, whatever it may be after the NCAA tournament. It's just it's such an easy fix. It's such an easy thing that the NCAA could do and control, and they don't. And I don't understand it. Well, and again, you and I talked about this earlier in the week. It's not like. And this is I can't I'm saying this in quotes. It's not like academically these kids need to be at their next school right away. I mean, it's it, it you know, it, it's different with college football a little bit in that the end of the season falls pretty much right when the semester ends and you, you know, get to sure. whatever the second week of January and second semester is about to begin. Yeah. You know, yeah. <laughs> that's not happening yeah. at all. Not at all. Um, no. From a college basketball standpoint, when the season and so, again, from a Big Ten standpoint today, both Illinois and Michigan State uh, won their openers yesterday. So you'll have Northwestern at 12-15. We've talked about that. Uh, Brooks Barnheiser and company taking on Dusty May. That will be the opener today. Nebraska and A&M, that is 50. Wisconsin and 31 win James Madison. I know a lot Ooh, of people have that like as a 12 one. 5 upset. Oh, yeah. That is a late one on Friday, uh, or today, I should say, approximately 9 40. And of course, Purdue and Grambling, 7 25. That is approximately over at Gamebridge Fieldhouse. All right, the great Lynn Dunn, she's going to join us coming up in about 40. So we'll chat with a variety of things with her, but continue the bracket conversation coming up next. It is the wake up call. 93.5, 1075, The Fan. Hey, Andy! America's greatest hot rod tradition is back.
It's the Wake Up Call with KB and Andy on 93.5 and 107.5. The Fan. Great stuff there from Bruce Weber. You miss any of that, check it out. 1075thefan.com or wherever you download your podcast. Lynn Dung going to join us coming up at 930. We'll play some Matt Painter sound coming up in about 10 minutes or so. KB, we only have a couple minutes here. I wanted to I wanted to throw this your way. Uh, do you know who Bobby Smitherin is by any chance? I don't know if you saw this uh, story Sounds yesterday. like a guy that won the... 1932 British Open. <laughs> it really does. Yeah, he won the PGA back in the 30s. No, he is the Long Beach State Athletic Director who before... Oh, he yeah, stinks before, now that you say his name. <laughs> yeah, I know who he is. Before the conference tournament, he fired Dan Monson. Yesterday, he told the Associated Press, and this became a big story yesterday during the games. Uh, he basically said, I'll read the quote, but to paraphrase, he said, I was hoping by firing the coach before the conference tournament that we would get on a roll he said quote my belief and hope is that by doing what i did and the timing of it they would play inspired and that's what they did i'm not trying to pat myself on the back but it worked and ad actually said that about firing his coach and letting him coach the rest of the season every former coach crushed your boy bobby smitherin yesterday I saw people tweeting the second half. He needs to fire Dan Monson again <laughs> to refire the team up there as Arizona started oh, to assert man. themselves. Again, for those that missed it yesterday, we did see the rest of the Purdue bracket play out all other uh, six games below them and seeds two through five. And I guess if you want to go, um, I guess the six seed was the best seed that lost South Carolina, lost to Oregon, but Tennessee dominated St. Peter's. Creighton struggled for what, about a half with Akron and then was in control the rest of the way. Kansas benefited from the old anticipated whistle oh, yeah. in the final 20 seconds of the game, a brutal call against Samford that could have certainly made a difference in that one. But Kansas was up 20 in that game, and then Gonzaga just dominated McNeese. That was a blow-up of a Cinderella pick. I was one for three on my Cinderella's. That's not bad. I mean, yeah, that's not bad at all. I, I mean, got Oakland. No, and, yeah. and that should count as like ten because it was Kentucky. The, yeah. the one that ticked me off the most was Michigan State being Mississippi oh, State. Yeah, because Michigan State they are my Achilles heel well, in the tournament. Of, they hit a bunch of threes. The years I, mean, I pick them to go deep, they get bounced totally early. Agree. The years I have them get bounced early, they go deep. So I I do not care and for Tom Izzo's like, squad. Everyone's like Izzo in March. I'm like, uh, okay. He Mississippi hasn't, State he's was a the, Sweet Sixteen yeah, he has, team he has, for me. He hasn't done that great, but I was most strong with Mississippi State. Uh, but I but I did nail. Let's see, I did nail. Oh, goodness, here. I did nail the Oregon, the NC State. Um, I thought I was going to be right on Drake, so I was right a little bit. I, I think I hit about 73% in my brackets yesterday, which is whatever. It's okay. Three elevens and a 14 all advanced yesterday. On the other side, we'll try and help Purdue fans breathe. And Lynn Dunn, the Fever GM, you think she's got oh, – well, maybe it's an obvious decision, but certainly big things coming her way in, in a few. Tired of breathing in poor quality air?
It's the Wake Up Call with KB and Andy on 93.5 and 107.5. The Fan. All right, your tournament headquarters. We got it right here on The Fan. Hour number three, KB and Andy, Wake Up Call, as always, broadcasting live from the drivehubler.com studios. Purdue back in action tonight against Grambling State 725. We've talked a lot about that. You can catch that one uh, on TBS. That's going to be a lot of fun. Reminder, Lynn Dunn going to join us here coming up in about a half an hour. KB, what's up with the Bowens today? What are you guys doing? So I think we're going to go out to um, – I, I don't know, like, how deep we're actually going to get into Brown County State Park at some point. Okay. Like, All right, should we just transition to a playground here? Uh, so, <laughs> a little hike. Uh, I but like it's supposed that. to be a really nice day down yeah. here. I think we're going to do Big Woods a little okay. bit later. Um, so, yeah, Maddie just headed out with the kids. They're going to Ooey Gooey Cinnamon Roll Place, which sounds awesome. Awesome. That does sound good. And they bring some back for you. Are you going to get any, or is everyone going to eat there? Are you left well, alone to I, your, your banana and your cereal this morning? What's happening? Very supportive wife. I okay. think she will bring one back. And then, what's the hotel breakfast spread over there? <laughs> well, <laughs> we're in an Airbnb, actually. Flakes. Yeah, they're in an Airbnb. Yeah. So. Oh, yeah, that's yeah. right. Yeah. Well, so you, you can go, go through their stuff. You just try to restock. from a continental standpoint here. but <laughs> And then hopefully Max will be down by... I mean, let's be honest. Yeah. It ain't starting at 725 tonight, no. right? Purdue, Purdue starting at what, 751? Oh, yeah. I mean, I think at least 740. They'll move it back 15 minutes. They moved. For people that don't know, you know, the, the early session could go long. That's what happened with Kentucky-Oakland. They moved that game back about 15 to 20 minutes. They moved that game back. So, if you're a Purdue fan downtown, be ready. When they move everybody out, there's probably going to be some long lines, I would imagine, to get into GameBridge. Just a guess. I'm going to. You know, I, I just tweeted out, Purdue fans, can we just play the damn game? I, I mean, know. like, that's I, – I, I, I feel like we have reached that point in all of this. And I will add, and I don't know, maybe I feel like I'm sitting next to Maddie delivering our two children. I'm trying to, like, help Purdue fans breathe here on this Friday morning. <laughs> I don't know if this will help Purdue fans at all, Andy, but I'll mention it. And I have mentioned this a couple of times throughout the week. Certainly, we saw it a handful of years ago. Virginia uh, really run off the floor by UMBC. That, that, that I mean, that was right. Uh, UMBC was controlled blowout. that game of the second half. Virginia comes back the next year. They get a one seed, just like Purdue. They were down eleven to Gardner Webb late in the first half of that one versus sixteen matchup. The very next year, they were down six at halftime. I. I, I <laughs> I, There's no way that's going to happen tonight. I'm can you imagine? You. I no, I can't imagine. I cannot imagine if that. I have them winning 95-67. That's my final. Not that anyone cares about my final score tonight, but I cannot imagine if we're watching this game, KB, and you're eating the leftovers from ooey gooey cinnamon roll or whatever mm-hmm. it is, and if we get to halftime and the score is 37-30, Grambling State. I just I, I, I just can't even imagine a world. Now, maybe on Sunday, you know, the 8-9 game can always be close. But as far as it goes tonight, I just, boy, I, that to me would be, it would be the shock of all shocks with the rhetoric coming from Purdue this season and the way they played. Like we talk about, you know, Virginia, man, remember that when they won the national title the year after losing to UMBC? Well, there were some moments in that first round game where it was fire Tony Bennett, probably more probably quicklier than Kentucky wants to fire Calipari right now. Um, So, yeah, I I don't know if that will help Purdue fans breathe anymore or not, but I I guess I just felt the need to mention it. (laughs) I mean, there was yesterday. So, am I wrong? Arizona lost in the first round last last year, right? Or was that the second? Yeah. So, Arizona's a two seed. You know, that was a struggle. They were up six at halftime. I'm sitting there saying, if Arizona loses in the 215 in the first round again, I I mean, we're going to have to look at, and I like Tommy Lloyd, but we'd have to start looking at Tommy Lloyd at Arizona and saying, hey, hey, man, what are you doing at March? They turn it on. They win by 20. And then Creighton was in a five-point game at half. Akron was giving them everything they wanted. Early lead there. Creighton comes back. They win by 17. Probably could have won by more, uh, if we're being honest. They dominated there in latter parts of the game. And I already said this. You know, Illinois Moorhead State, and I'm blanking on his name. Preston Spradling is the coach at Moorhead State. I think he's a really good coach, actually. I don't know if he'll ever get, you know, the call up, if you will, to the big uh, to the big time. They, you know, Illinois was up one 
uh, there at half. They go on and they win by 16. They went on a 33 to 10 run at one point. That game was tied at 48 in the second half. The reason I bring that up, those are high seeds, a couple three seeds and a two seed that were met with that adversity in the first half all the way to halftime and in the early parts of the second half. And and they, you know, they regrouped and, and did the damn thing. I don't see that happening tonight. And that's what's difficult about playing on Friday and Sunday, the weekend. We don't have a show on Saturday. We were joking about this, KB, that, you know, I almost feel like the analysis for Purdue tonight is easy, but it's more about the round of 32. You know, I mean, an 8-9 game is a, a team like a Michigan State, somebody like that that can play you within three, four possessions. If a guy gets hot, you turn the ball over. Zach Eady gets in foul trouble. Uh, suddenly, you're in a tenuous situation. I wanted to play one piece of sound, uh, and I don't know. I don't want to speak for you here, but this annoys you just a little bit from Matt Painter and, and when he talks about Zach Eady. Is that right? I'm just, just, just a little bit. I, I, I'm just tired of the Zach Eady. We talk about him and how he's officiated for three okay. minutes, seemingly every Matt Painter press conference. <laughs> like, I love listening to Matt Painter. Right. Like he is, uh, he is on the short list of coaches I really enjoy listening to because he's super expansive yeah, on agree. a variety of topics. And, and I guess I've just heard the answer maybe so many times that I'm over it. I, I get where Painter's coming from. I mean, he's seven four and three hundred pounds and. As Dante Jackson told us, we'll throw the kitchen sink in the backyard. And how, by the way, someone told me Dante Jackson may be rumored for the IUPUI job. I don't, I don't. That that, that would be kind huh. of a wild okay. one to me. I would think Paul well, Casar would make a lot of sense. He's our friend. A lot more sense from a local connection. But yeah, I'm just a little. Um, I don't need to hear the answer anymore. I'd rather hear Matt well, Painter talk it. about a variety of other you're topics. You're going to hear it. You're going to hear it. We're going to force feed <laughs> you're, you're in Nashville, Indiana. We're going to force feed you this one, okay? Yeah, if you get cinnamon yeah. rolls later, you have to sit through those. Yeah, I'm sitting here with coffee and a banana, okay? You're going to you're gonna listen to this one this minute and six second. This is my sacrifice second. right here. This is it. You're going to listen to this one minute and six second <laughs> answer. He gave a similar answer with JMV on, what was it, Monday or Tuesday, and he, was, uh, he wasn't even asked about Zach Eady and fouls. He morphed into it. It's something nationally. I think here's what it is. Is. The national media flies in and they watch a couple Big Ten tournament games, right? And now they're like, okay, so Zach Eady, he he's officiated differently than everybody else. I think, you know, it annoys Matt Painter. Here's Painter on Zach Eady, foul trouble, how he's officiated, and everything else. Like the people that complain about him getting fouls or whatever, that aren't the people that are guarding him because they know they can't guard him. Like the people in our league that complain the most are the ones that can't guard him. And so it gets down to the coaches and the players complaining all the time. And it's just, it's just really reverse psychology. That's all it is to try to get them to say, well, look at the fouls, look at the fouls. You know, it's one of the dumbest things that coaches say is, hey, the fouls are seven to two. Well, one team fouled seven times, one, one team fouled twice. No, it's not dumb. It, it's, but through 100 years of basketball, somehow you've all sat in games and said it's seven to two. I bet you this evens up real quick. And it evens up, and you're like, see, I'm a prophet. I know what I'm saying. Why it always evens up is is really not officiating. It's really not basketball. It shouldn't even up. Or it should even up if that's what happens, right? So you shouldn't have those predetermined thoughts as officials that it has to even up. You know, he's getting fouled every single play. And so I think people don't like that piece of it. But, you know, he's elite and he's different. And so I think that's why he gets a lot of pushback. Now, again, Andy, I am just tired of hearing the answer because I, I, I've heard it so many times because Matt Painter gets asked about it. And to your point, Matt loves to kind of just on his own go down that that path. Uh, I don't know if he feels the need to remind people or officiating wise when there are some different officials, whatever, during the tournament. Having said all that, it's such a great weapon for Purdue. I mean, it is such a great advantage that they have that – you know, Zach Eady is able to draw the amount of fouls that he does um, from fouling other people out and really just getting into the bonus. I think that is such a huge deal with teams. I mentioned it kind of explaining some of my bracket process. Honestly, one of the reasons why I picked Oakland was because they're a good foul shooting team. Last night, they couldn't make a free throw to save their lives, and luckily, they still won the game. But, you know, again, go back to like Fairleigh Dickinson last year for, for Purdue. They were in the bonus midway through the second half. Right. I mean, they, think about that. Yeah, they didn't take advantage of it. They should have yeah, shot 20 it, free throws. So on a night where you go 5 of 26 from three, 
you should still have the ability to offset that by going whatever, 25 of 32 from the foul line or something. You know, Purdue has had these big 30, 35. Didn't they shoot 40 against Northwestern? And Chris Collins was kind of ranting about that. So it is huge for Purdue. It's one of the biggest, I think, stats, if I were Matt Painter, that I would look towards of saying, you know, by that 8 to 10-minute mark left and a half, I want to be in the bonus because, again, that is such a huge, consistent strength they can rely on, and it kind of helps you get out of lulls. You know, if if you miss whatever, five in a row from behind the arc or, you know, possessions just aren't going as fluidly as you would like, the ability to throw it into Edie, and he's a very good foul shooter for a guy that's 7'4", that's massive. So as much as I'm just tired of hearing the explanation – it, it, I, I will not deny for a second, it's an unbelievable weapon that Purdue has. At one point yesterday, Oakland was shooting a better percentage from three than from the free throw line. Now, it didn't oh, it was painful. It didn't end up that way. I can't believe it didn't cost them. I mean, honestly, it, that would have been the heartbreak. They, they shot 13 of 23 from the free throw line. That's good for 56.5%. They ended up shooting 15 of 31 from three for 48.4. Uh, but I found that funny uh, as well. But I don't know. You just you you mentioned Purdue. I mean, getting uh, – this is for later in the tournament, but getting to the line, not settling for threes, it's so easy, especially if a team is throwing junk defenses at you. You know this, KB, to just kind of settle. You know, Brayden Smith and Fletcher Lawyer, and I would say Jones as well, these guys just settling for threes. There's no need for that, right? Test it. Thro- I, think, I think what you mentioned is key. You know, later in this tournament, we'll probably talk about this next week, if they keep winning, obviously, is, you know, throwing it into Edie. They made an effort. Can you think of a game this year where they didn't throw it in to to Edie and we walked away? They're so disciplined. I I know. It's one of their better attributes of, you know, oftentimes I think teams have a big guy and they don't give – or they might throw it into him early in a possession, and then when they reset, they just don't think they can get it back into him again. Purdue does that. Purdue is very committed to throwing it into him multiple times within a shot clock. Um, and that's why I'm curious to see again, again, m- maybe not tonight, but, you know, fairly Dickinson threw some of that pressure at them last year, and that kind of slowed their offense. Teams have done that. Um, and it sounds like, you know, Dante Jackson, based off what he said to us yesterday, they will take the approach of, by all cost, we will not let Edie get right. one-on-one matchups, which, again, some teams have played that way. Some teams, you know, this is one thing that always at times frustrated me about Mike Bray and Notre Dame. Bray would have the statement of threes are worth more than twos. I'll let the post guy try to go one-on-one because we can live with that. If you make a flurry of threes on me, we can't live with that. Now, if Dante Jackson chooses to do that tonight, Purdue's got the second-best three-point shooting team in the nation. Last year, they were 290th in threes. So that's where Purdue... I think, you know, the Bruce Weber comments from a half hour ago, why are they better suited? Why do you feel more confident? Those are some of the reasons why. Uh, Lynn Dunn going to join us in about 15 minutes. We'll get to uh, a morning check down here in a, se- in a second. Uh, but had, had, a, had a question for you. Um, okay, so I'm in this eliminator just to talk about the games today. You know, you get to pick one team per day of the tournament, but you can't pick a team twice, right? So yesterday, I took Illinois. And I think that's solid because I don't think they're a Final Four team. Uh, And I thought they – now, early on, that didn't look too safe. I was worried. I was really worried. But it's like $20 a day, basically, to pick a team. So this could end up costing me a couple hundred dollars. But there's there's a lot of money in the kitty, if you will, okay? Uh, So who would you pick today? Now, I don't have Auburn going as far as you do, okay? Ooh, see, I got Auburn going far. I, I, I know. So, I have Auburn obviously winning today over Yale. Uh, I've been winning the next game, but I don't know. what After after the, you know, the Sweet 16, I thought about going Colorado, but again, it's like an NFL suicide pool. If I waste, you know, if I go Colorado, the 10 seed there, and they lose, I'm going to look like an idiot, and I'm done, right? In day two, you can't go Duke. Um, I don't want to use Houston. Baylor? Baylor's probably uh, – Baylor and Marquette were on the top of my list because they're two and three seeds. I don't have Marquette going too far, but I do have them winning this particular game. So I'm down between, I think, Baylor and Marquette. That's where I'm yeah, that's, that's where I'm going. I'd probably lean a little Baylor. 
I don't know. I feel like last year I picked Colgate, and they just now. Oh, I, now I, I think just, I did I, too. Yeah. I don't buy their toothpaste. I don't do anything now. Um, <laughs> that's probably where I would go. I can't believe Jack Golke is three months older than Tyrese Halliburton. <laughs> He's got the hairline of an aging man. He well, I told him. I, I, I I'll DM him about We Grow Hair Indy. Yeah, you should. I'm sure his DMs are full. I'm mm-hmm. sure his DMs, he might want to turn them off. You know, I got looking at this Purdue Or he game just too. whizzes past the one that's Kevin Bowen. He's yeah. like, I got other ones the that one, are more yeah, important. Oh, Mark, the one come on now. The one that's a dude, he just uh, whizzes by those. Uh, okay, so what do you think? I'm just looking at ESPN. I know there's different marketplaces and everything else. What do you think the get-in price, the lowest tickets as low as? You know, ESPN does that. Tickets as low as. What do you think? That number is for Purdue and Grambling State tonight. What do you think? What do you guys think? So it's just the night session. It's yeah, that, um, yeah. That's that's all it is. One seventy eight. Uh, I'll say north of two bills. Okay, so it, it's a little bit less. Tickets as low as uh, one hundred and fifty dollars. The only okay. reason I bring it up is if you look at the other ones, Baylor Colgate in Memphis. Tickets as low as two dollars. San Diego State UAB. They're playing uh, in Spokane. Tickets as low as seven dollars. Uh, Clemson, New Mexico, two dollars. Auburn, Yale, seven dollars. Uh, Nebraska A and M, five dollars. The only one that rivals it. Duke and Vermont playing in Brooklyn. One fifty nine is that price to get in. That's all the Duke fans in New York. That's all that is. I mean, pretentious it's, Duke I, fans. I think today or tonight, I should say, and I think Sunday, it's going to feel like a road game for whoever's playing Purdue. I, I don't think it's going to be the, oh, uh, you know, everybody else in the arena bands together and roots for the Cinderella. No. Like, I don't think there'll be enough people in the building for that to happen tonight. And that's, I think, a huge advantage Purdue will have. To- and then again on Sunday. And if you go back, and it's something, you know, I've brought up throughout the week. I mean, you go back to the one time Purdue has been in that building this year, you know, one versus three, they beat Arizona, and they shot it great, over 50% from the floor, over 40% from three. Braden Smith and Fletcher Lawyer were outstanding shooting the basketball in that game. Smith had 26, he hit four threes. Lawyer had 27, he hit five threes. I mean, they both were great against those Arizona guards. So, again, I think all of that from a Purdue standpoint you know, gives you some hope uh, that, you know, not only tonight, but probably more on Sunday that you can shoot it well in that building. Yeah, I'm, I'm interested to see Lance Jones. He was, what, one of eight, I believe, in the Big Ten tournament, scored 19 points in two games. I, yeah, I, he, I, he's had some recent struggles. Yeah, I mean, I, it's not a slump, okay? It's not that. I want to be clear. It's not a slump, but, you know, we're nitpicking here, and not tonight, but starting on Sunday, it will, you know, these things will matter, right? You know, Lance Jones making a couple more shots or Fletcher Lawyer not being Oh, I don't know. If Fletcher Lawyer is one of five, you know, if he's if he's two of five or three of five, that's a big difference in a game. And so those are the things I, I'm just I, I'm looking tonight for them to feel good about themselves. I don't view it as much as getting the monkey off their back. I think that is much more for later in the tournament, but you have to start somewhere, right? And, and I think all of these are good building blocks, confidence builders, if you will, and I think they win again. My score tonight's easy. I, I'm 95-67. I think they take care of business. I think they win by a bunch of points. So this goalkey kid is out of eligibility. Yeah, sorry to Mike Woodson. Does Mike Woodson, will he learn his name if uh, he came to Bloomington? You know, would... So Jack Golke hit 10 threes <laughs> last night. If I have this right, IU hit more than 10 threes in one game all season. Oh, goodness. What game was that? Was that Kansas? North Alabama. Oh, they hit of 12. Course. I only think they hit nine in one game if I'm looking at this right. Boy, Jack Golke's just living the life. 327 three-point attempts on the year. Eight two-point attempts. He's volleyball line to volleyball. He can't guard (laughs) anybody, by the way. I loved him saying that after the game, and Campy's nodding his head yes. I mean, that dude... He is such a liability on defense. Did you see? Did you see the end of the game? I think it was a. I think okay. So Kentucky fouls, and it was either a two or a three point game. 
and the players uh, for uh, for Oakland were just basically almost in the crowd. Like, they were getting the crowd all hyped up and everything, and he called everybody over, and you could read you could read his lips. This isn't effing over. The game's not bleeping over. The game, he kept saying that over and over again, and they did enough to end the game, but I did find that to be funny. And, I mean, listen, Oakland, uh, Oakland NC State, somebody's going to make the Sweet 16. It's either going to be this great story of Oakland or it's going to be NC State who would have won now seven games in a row to get to the Sweet 16 if they win on Saturday, which is unbelievable. Yeah, we are guaranteed at least one double-digit seed. Again, all three 11 seeds won yesterday, and as Andy said, we'll get that 11-14 matchup uh, tomorrow night, NC State in Oakland. Before we get to Lynn Dunn in a few, we'll do a morning check down. Also, I'll plug this. I'm going to be up uh, at Old Pro's Table, one of my favorite spots, OPTs, uh, in Broad Ripple tomorrow night starting at 8 o'clock. We got a little Jack Daniels. Nice. Small ball challenge, one of my favorite things we do each and every March. So uh, we'll be out there again, 8 o'clock, OPTs, the winner. So uh, basically look at it as kind of like semifinal night tomorrow night, the final uh, will be Final Four weekend. The winner will get $1,000. So come on out tomorrow night. We'll be watching Oakland NC State, among other things. And the games, uh, OPT's 8 o'clock for that. More information up on our website, events tab, 1075thefan.com. All right, before we get to Lynn Dunn, let's check it down. The Morning Checkdown, brought to you by the Women's Basketball Invitation Tournament. Elevate the game at the inaugural WBIT, coming to Hinkle Fieldhouse, April 1st and 3rd. Yeah, it is Purdue, Grambling State, 27 and a half point favorite are the Boilers. Tonight, that one right around 725, right down the road at Gamebridge. You can catch it TV-wise on TBS. Matt Painter yesterday met with the media, taking what other teams give. That's the key for Purdue in this NCAA tournament. Whatever they give you, take. You know, as long as that's yours, right? You know, each guy's a little bit different in terms of what their strengths and weaknesses are. So that's what we really talk about. Like what they give, if they're going to give you the pull-up, take the pull-up. If they're going to give you a layup, take the layup. You know, if they're going to allow you to throw back and go in, do that. But if not, move the basketball and move bodies and just end up taking what they give you and feel good about that and then get on the glass. So just th- that's really been our focus more than anything to stay process-based and to run our stuff. So it has risen to the biggest spread in round one, 27.5 point favorite Purdue over Grambling. And Grambling, not a a fast-paced tempo team. They don't shoot a lot of threes. They don't make a lot of threes. They only shot 10 of them the other night. They have won 10 of 11, their only loss in that stretch in double OT. So again, approximately 725 tonight over at Gamebridge. Uh, Late tonight, it'll be the Pacers out west, final West Coast trip of the season. Golden State, uh, that is a 10 o'clock tip. The Warriors are favored by four and a half in that one. Golden State has not won back-to-back games all month. They are 10th right now in the Western Conference, clinging to that final play-in spot. Speaking of the play-in, with Brooklyn losing last night, the Pacers have clinched at least a play-in spot. Obviously, the goal is to be where they're at right now, really, if not move up. Uh, They're currently sixth, clinging themselves uh, by half game uh, to one of those spots just outside of the play-in. Again, for the Warriors, Steph Curry has looked just fine after the ankle injury and returning from that. Uh, this will be his fourth game back from that. Trace Jackson Davis producing very consistently off the bench for the Warriors, not something he was doing when these teams met a little over a month ago. Uh, but Steve Kerr finally getting him a uh, consistent opportunity, and Trace Jackson Davis taking advantage of it. Obi Toppin is questionable for tonight for the Pacers with a left ankle sprain. Yeah, I didn't see what happened, what happened to Obi. When did that happen? I, I didn't I, I see don't that. Did remember I remember him. Yeah, I don't remember him mm. getting hurt. No. Uh, you know, at least visibly um, the other night. And again, we didn't see Jalen Smith the other night. Uh, Isaiah Jackson took those minutes, and Jalen Smith hadn't been playing too poorly. Right. It's not like he had been in in a recent slump. So I am curious how Isaiah Jackson was outstanding. Curious how Rick Carlisle will divvy up those minutes, and you know, without Obi Toppin, you might have one of your 
bigger guys need to play the four. Or who knows? Maybe Jairus Walker will get some minutes there. Yeah, last thing for me here on the check down, Malik Renew coming back to uh, to IU announcing that yesterday. Uh, so we'll see exactly how many scholarship players Indiana will have going into the offseason. But we know Anthony Leal, Trey Galloway, Malik Renew all going to be back next season. That was announced. Was it Hoosier Hysterics? That was during the games, the early the uh, the early session there, we found out Malik Renew is going to be back for a third straight season. Not sure you'll find a happier individual, or well, maybe until our no, Wildcats well, played last yeah. night, than the one and only Lynn Dunn. Friday energy abound with the great Lynn Dunn, the Fever GM. She's got quite the date circled on the calendar coming up. We'll chat with Lynn Dunn next here. It is the wake up call. Bombing problems stink. The Wake Up Call with KB and Andy on 93.5 and 107.5. The Fan. Pop 
quiz. We'll do that here in about 15 minutes or so. A freebie Friday. You'll get that Jiffy Lube oil change. Also a $25 gift card to Cluster Trucks. So we'll do that. You miss any of our conversations. Purdue leading up to tonight's uh, 1 verse 16 there down the road in Gamebridge. We've talked a lot about that. Greg Rakestraw joined us. Head coach Bruce Pearl. Uh, Bruce Pearl. Bruce Weber joined us. Hey, Bruce Pearl might join us next week if they keep winning. Uh, anyway, Bruce, I think, come uh, on. Some IU That'd fans would fun. like him to be in Bloomington permanently. Wow. He was going to walk to the job, remember? He was just going to walk right there from Auburn uh, to Indiana. Bruce Weber joining us. Check all those out at 1075thefan.com. All right, so it's been it's been a few months since we uh, spoke with the GM there with the Indiana Fever. Lynn Dunn joining us here on the Payless Liquors Hotline. Lynn, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, listen, before we get to your team, the upcoming draft and everything else, uh, how are you handling? Handling your Kentucky Wildcats losing last night. Are you okay this morning? I've got big blue hangover. <laughs> Good <laughs> gracious. Let me ask y'all a question. This sure. Jack Golke, the one that hit 10 threes, is he, how old is he? 36, 37? Yeah, he's 25, isn't he, KB? Something like that. Like he's 24. three months been older than Tyrese Halliburton, coach. Yeah, that's what I thought. He's been in school six years. I mean, he looked, he's, he looked like a grown man playing against boys. I, I just – he wowed me. He really did. Yeah, it's unbelievable. He took some shots last night. I'm like, man, I'm going to lose more hair than Jack Golke's losing <laughs> if I keep on watching <laughs> some of these shots that he's taking. Lynn, you'll love this. He he played in his team – ousted Tyler Hero's team uh, in the Wisconsin High School Basketball State Finals. And Tyler Hero is finishing his fifth year in the NBA, and Golke's knocking out your Kentucky Wildcats all these years later. It's amazing how things work out sometimes. Well, I've moved on from Kentucky now. I'm, I'm, I'm supporting the Purdue Boilermakers okay. now. I've, I've already bumped here them over here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but I saw some ooh. great games yesterday. It was a fun day. I love the upsets. I was really impressed, you know, with Duquesne, and I was, man, I, you know, Dayton's lucky to be alive. Uh, Nevada did a great job. It was just a great day of men's basketball. The women's tournament getting underway today. Obviously, a lot of storylines locally throughout the run here, and uh, it's been hell of a year, really, for the attention uh, towards the women's game. Lynn Dunn with us on the Payless Liquors Hotline. Coach, we started there with a negative thought. Let's go back to, I would say, quite the night for you when you found out you guys did indeed finally get that lottery luck and got the number one pick. How would you describe your emotion then? Unbelievable. It was just fantastic. I mean, the chances of getting the number one pick are really low. But to get it back-to-back after selecting Leah Boston last year, and now we have the opportunity to take the number one pick, best player available this year, it really is a boost for our franchise, and we are very excited about it. Pretty good guard from Iowa, right? I've heard that. (laughs) Um, I, I understand that she did declare. Uh, so she's in the pool now with, a, would say, a 10 really good players uh, in this draft. Makes this draft really tough. But, I, I, you know, kudos to Clark because she has really helped uh, draw an enormous amount of attention to women's college basketball this year. When she broke all those records and then all the female records, and the next thing I know she's going after Pistol Pete's record, I'm like, Wow. Yeah, it, it's uh, it's it's unbelievable uh, the amount, and you know, you know, I was not too far away from Indianapolis. That's about a five-hour drive. Uh, those tickets, uh, I think you'll get some Iowa area codes uh, for those tickets. Lynn Dunn with us here on the Payless Liquors Hotline. I, I listen. I don't know how much you want to say, how much you can say, but you know, right after Caitlin Clark put out there the message, "Hey, this is my final run at Iowa." Seconds later, you guys on social media put out, "Hey, tickets are available. Season tickets are available." for our team did you all know that she was going to put out there uh that she was committing herself to the WNBA draft or were you guys kind of in the dark like everybody else we were absolutely in the dark we had no idea we've had no contact uh with any of the uh, draft prospects that's something we don't do we stay clear of all of them and so when she posted that uh, notice, I think it was on Twitter or X or whatever that thing's called, uh, <laughs> we were caught by we were we were surprised. But I can tell you this: there are still tickets available. We haven't sold out yet, and so if there's anybody in the Central Indiana area still interested in tickets, go to feverbasketball.com. 
you can feverbasketball.com there uh, um, for the Fever as their season gets underway. Is it, is it the 16th or 17th, the home opener of May? Uh, the home opener is 5-16 against uh, New York, who played in the finals last year. So, big right. night of, of basketball. Uh, the draft is, is April the uh, 15th. Um, and so now I am in heaven because today I'm going to see 16 women's games. Um, you know, and of course I'm keeping an eye on uh, Notre Dame and I'm keeping an eye on Indiana. Those two women's teams are two of my favorites. Uh, and I'm excited about what they might be able to do in the tournament. Yeah. Again, Notre Dame, they've got Kent state a little banged up. The Irish Hannah Hidalgo has been unbelievable as a freshman. And then IU will get things started tomorrow a uh, thirty-one and one Fairfield wow. inside of Assembly <laughs> Hall there for Terry Morin's bunch. Uh, Lynn, I, I know you have seen Iowa in person quite a few times. How would you describe just the just the atmosphere? I mean, you've watched women's basketball for your entire life. Just the atmospheres uh, from a crowd and an energy, and probably even a young girl standpoint that you see surrounding Caitlin Clark in Iowa. I've never seen anything like it, Kevin. I, I, it's, it's unbelievable. Uh, you, you know, I've seen some se- a few sellouts, but to go back to back to back, home and away sellouts, and then to see grown men with wearing a, a, a female basketball player's jersey, and then see all the little girls and little boys and everybody clamoring. It, it's just, I've never seen anything like it. It's amazing, and it's thrilling, and I'm excited that we're finally getting the visibility uh, for college women's basketball. Let me tell you what, I love to watch college women's basketball. They move, they cut, they pass, they share the basketball. Um, I, I think some of the broadcasters have even talked about how much they're enjoying watching the women's game. Again, that's feverbasketball.com. Tickets still available, and it's going to be uh, quite the fun season. You know, I'm always interested, and again, Lynn Dunn with us here on the Payless Liquors Hotline. I, it, you know, tournament's not the only time where it's much like the NFL. You know, we, we go through the NFL combine. It's like, well, you have you have tape on all these players, right? Do you need to watch them do certain things? And the NCAA tournament can be a very small sample size. You have years of data on these players. And whether it be at the, the beginning or the other picks that you all will have uh, coming up here in the upcoming WNBA draft, how do you as a general manager, you mentioned you're going to be watching 16 games today. How how do you watch and evaluate all of these games and all of these players? Because it's not only Caitlin Clark who you'll be drafting coming up here. Right. Uh, we've got the first pick, the 15th pick, and the 27th pick. But I can assure you we've got data coming out of our ears. You know, analytics is a big thing now. But we've been watching a lot of these players that will be in the draft since they were sophomore in high school. You know, we're down to our pool of players that we would seriously consider – uh, one through 27, and we're focused in on them. But we're also now watching the underclassmen, how they're performing in this championship uh, experience in the NCAA. So if there's a process throughout the whole year. You know, I, I, I can't even tell you how many times I've seen the five or six that we're considering play either on TV or in person. The sun has rose on this Friday morning, although for Big Blue Nation, maybe it you know it still hasn't yet. Lynn Dunn is mourning with us here, but she's very excited about the day of hoops ahead as the women's tournament gets underway. And also, thank you to Tony for texting me this. Shout out to Purdue and Butler. That's going to be a women's NIT game coming up on Monday at Hinkle Fieldhouse. Even more local flavor here locally. Um, Coach, it, it, I feel like, and my hand is raised, and I tried to say this when the announcement was that you guys got the number one pick a few weeks ago, in that I don't think we did a good enough job in explaining how unbelievable the rookie campaign was for Aaliyah Boston and how great of a player she is and what a vitally important building block you have. And certainly if you add a dynamic guard to that, quite the one-two punch. For our listeners out there that maybe didn't pay as much attention to you guys last year, could you describe what Aaliyah Boston meant as a rookie? Well, first of all, uh, thank you for bringing up Aaliyah Boston because she had an unbelievable rookie season, was a consensus, unanimous, whatever you want to say, rookie of the year. And I think it's fair to say that Aaliyah didn't hit a home run. She hit a grand slam home run. She came in, she had, uh, you know, she has, uh, asserted herself uh, as a four, five, five, four, whatever you want to call. 
and just had an outstanding season as a rookie. And we're really looking forward to what her second season is going to be like. When you add the first pick with Kelsey Mitchell, with Nalissa Smith, and with Aaliyah Boston, you know, the future looks bright for the Fever. And we're really excited about the direction that we're going. April 15th. My wife has it in the calendar, Lynn. Um, girls only party, draft party with her girlfriends. One of her <laughs> good great. girlfriends played at University of Indianapolis. Girls draft it. party, bring it. your daughters, <laughs> April 15th. She's ready to go. Well, you know what's interesting? I, I watched the phenomenon of the Swifties with Taylor Swift, and I'm starting <laughs> to think with, with Caitlin Clark, we've got the Clarkies. When I see <laughs> oh, I like it. Girls, it's amazing. I like it. So you could, I can go ahead and pr- I've got a three and a half year old daughter. You, you're saying I can go ahead and pre-order the old Caitlin Clark fever jersey for? Her? Well, now I'm not saying that because all I can tell you today is we're going to take the best player available. But I love the fact that you've got a daughter. Now, what about her skills? Has she is she able to dribble yet? Uh, well, I mean, she's born in Indiana. She can shoot. We're not worried about dribbling. She can jack Golke yet. <laughs> well. <laughs> yeah we love jack today don't we yeah we do oh, i know imagine. i'm sorry if that's to, you know pouring some salt into your wounds here on this but friday imagine, morning but the... uh, yeah i imagine calipari might be in the jack you know from last <laughs> night <laughs> he might be yeah. i think i think that is well well said well coach we cannot wait for uh, certainly april 15th and uh thursday may 16th again things get started from a home standpoint for the fever seven o'clock with the liberty they actually have a noon game monday may 20th uh there early in the season and we'll see if the clarkies indeed infiltrate <laughs> gamebridge Fieldhouse a whole lot this year Lynn, we always love your energy. Enjoy all the basketball here over the next few weeks, and uh, looking forward to having you on here around draft time. Hey, guys, thank you, and good luck to the Purdue Boilermakers, Matt Painter and that crew, to Notre Dame, and to the IU women. The one and only Lynn Dunn Thanks, there Lynn. on the Payless Liquors Hotline. I love that woman, Andy. Oh, yeah. I, I she uh, It's a long night. She probably, knowing basketball the way she does, she saw the beginning of that game and thought, this is, oh, boy, it's going to be a long two hours. Uh, it's going to be a long two hours. I love her. We'll take the best player available. I do I do love that. I mean, you just think. I, I, the, the I the, thought we both tried there. We I both really struck did. out, but we both had the bat off our shoulder at least, right? I mean, yeah, I can understand her not wanting to just say it. It's a it's a foregone conclusion at this point. But the, the, the amount of, I'd love to know, you know, how much, not only in demand, but the value of that ticket was what and what is it now? And then I would love to know the amount of merch they've sold uh, as well or will sell right after it, right when all the Cl- uh, Caitlin Clark stuff happens. I mean, it's got to be, you know, I mean, it's got to be sales would be up 120%. Like the numbers got to be astronomical. They have to. Well, I remember we did this exercise when they won the lottery a few weeks ago. We went on to the, again, tickets as low as for that home opener, which, again, is Thursday, May 16th. And as Lynn pointed out, the Liberty were in the finals last year. So, I mean, it, it's a you know it's a big-name opponent you get for your home opener. If you look right now, Gamebridge Fieldhouse, tickets as low as $252. I mean, oh, I, am light, I am right here. I don't know if I'm allowed Man. to say the secondary market site that I'm on right now. Andy, I've got a ticket in section 223. Wow. That's the, that's the highest in the arena. It's unbelievable. $1,000.52 <laughs> ticket. <laughs> the section next to it, 436, 436, 412 across the arena, 412, 335, 407. I mean, that's unbelievable. It is amazing. It really is. To see. What, and certainly Bloomington has felt it, and West Lafayette felt it. And for those that missed it, Wright Thompson, who in my opinion is the greatest oh, great. sports feature writer out there, he wrote a very long form. You're going to need about seven trips to the toilet to read that one. Uh, unbelievable <laughs> piece he wrote on Caitlin Clark. I encourage everyone out there to read that. So certainly we'll get Lynn Dunn back on come WNBA draft time. Is anybody going to upset South Carolina in the women's tournament? 
Uh, I don't know. I no, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say I'm gonna say no. Uh, I'm I'm interested in I'm actually interested low key in in LSU a little bit to see what they do. But no, if I had to, it's like you giving me. I usually take the field, but if if you gave me South Carolina or the field, I'd probably take South Carolina. I would like to see an Iowa LSU. Oh, of course, Final Four matchup. That'd be great. That'd be very good. Uh, someone was saying Iowa got like a bad draw. I don't. I'm not gonna pretend. They are in like, LSU's bracket. They got so, the yeah. they got the draw of death. The bracket of death isn't. Yeah, that- but I mean LSU is not like. I mean LSU is a three seed. I mean like uh, they don't get South Carolina till the title game. I I would think that's that's a good thing, right? See, see I like Mulkey. I like the the outfits and the ridiculousness. Oh, she's too crazy. Yeah, uh, she's- no, she's no, she's crazy. That's why I like her. Yeah, she's nuts. Yeah. Yeah, but honestly, they should fire Cal and hire Mulkey. That's what Big Blue Nation <laughs> there you go. needs. All right, pop quiz to round it out, boys. Yep, let's do it. 317-239-1070, cluster truck gift card, and freebie Friday with the oil change. We'll do that next. Tired of breathing in poor quality air at your workplace? APG Air, the region's...
Can you handle the pressure? Sharpen your pencils. It's time for the pop quiz with KB and Andy. Brought to you by Jiffy Lube, Indiana's favorite oil change since 1985. All right, it's a freebie Friday here on the Wake Up Call. Final segment before we get you into your weekend. You heard there uh, Jake doing the promo. Query and company coming your way at noon. JMV coming your way at 3 o'clock. Scotty's here. Scotty, do you know where JMV's at? He's on remote today. Oh, I should know that. I I hate to put you on the spot. I know he's on remote today. So he was in Winter Circle yesterday, yeah, right? Yeah, he's right downtown somewhere, and he said it like 19 times yesterday, and I put Scotty on the the spot i feel bad so it's a freebie friday we'll have our jiffy lube oil change plus where's he at coach's tavern okay that's what i thought plus a 25 dollar gift card to cluster truck before we get to it Bijan robinson Bijan robinson the running back for atlanta kb yeah who ran all over the colts yeah all over the colts he has a perfect bracket through day <laughs> one of the, of the ncaa tournament so good to be him I would need to go out in the living room, but I think Rosie got more right in round one. I would need to have to check her bracket. I think she got more right in round one than Dude, I did. that's why I never hate if someone's like, I'm doing it. You know, I don't watch college basketball or or mascots or colors or whatever. Hey, you're going to do as good of a job as I'm going to do. But I've got Oakland in the Sweet 16. I, I, so that, I that's, my, that, that's, that, your calling that's my only card. hope right yeah, now. Yeah, that's your calling card. Uh, what do you want to go with? What caller number here? You go. You pick. Oh, boy. Golke hit 10 threes. Let's go with number three for Jack Golke here. All right, Ryan. Ryan. Hey, Ryan. What's up, man? Hey, good morning, guys. How you doing? Good. Hey, Ryan. Always good to hear from you, man. Were you happy about Kentucky losing? I'm always happy when Kentucky loses. <laughs> Let's go. Let's go. <laughs> Lynn Dunn is waiting for you in a dark alley, by the way. And I absolutely love that passion. Ryan, we're a bit up against it. Congrats on the Cluster Truck gift card. Hope the bracket is still intact. Andy Sweeney. Lead us off. All right, question number one, Ryan. The Pacers are in San Francisco to take on the Golden State Warriors tonight. This will be the 100th meeting all-time. How about that? Between the Pacers and Warriors, who leads the all-time series? I'll say the Pacers. There we go. Number two, Jack Golke hit 10 threes as the Golden Grizzlies upset number three seed Kentucky last night in the tournament. How many two-point field goals did Golke attempt, Ryan? Uh, Three. None, one, two, or four? Uh, two. All right, question number three. You Go- sure? Okay. Uh, I mean, maybe four, I think. You sure? But no, no, he didn't take any. <laughs> he I didn't remember. Take any. Yeah, that guy, he's crazy. He's like my age. <laughs> <laughs> Jack Golke, uh, his 10 threes, second most in an NCAA men's tournament game. Who holds the record? Is it Carson Edwards? Jeff Fryer, Freddie Banks, or Robert Sally? And I'm a Purdue guy. I really want to say Carson Edwards. Um, I guess I'll go with my gut. You can say Carson. Carson 10 threes in that infamous Elite Eight game. All right, which team advanced to the round of 32 for the first time since 1969? Was it Oakland, Duquesne? Dayton, Washington State, or Duquesne? I think it was Duquesne. All right, pretty good. Last question, uh, 1969. That 1969 tournament ended 55 years ago today with Rick Mount's Purdue Boilermakers losing to UCLA and Lou Al Cinders Bruins in the title game. Where was the final four held in 1969? Was it Kansas City, Houston, Louisville, or College Park, Maryland? Hmm. We'll go uh, Louisville. Ooh. Watch it, Ryan did good, man. What, what did he? That. Yeah, what did he miss? Just one of them? Did he miss well, just one? I mean, well, you helped him. Yeah, two yeah, was quite him. the effort. Yeah, but him. yeah, I mean, uh, the Carson Edwards one was the only one he missed, right? Jeff Fryer, the correct answer there. Yeah, Jeff Fryer, uh, correct answer there. You go back to number one, Pacers. Yes. Yeah! Uh, yeah, Pacers lead the uh, the Warriors, fifty two forty nine. What Golki shot that is zero correct. two pointers. Uh, Duquesne was the answer to number four. And then, yeah. Let's see. Uh, correct. 1969, no. Final Four held at Freedom Hall in Louisville. That's a W. That's E1. Uh, hug job. Purdue fans. Text them your support. 
we just need to play the damn game at this point. Andy Sweeney, um, I think the boil. I think we're talking about the Boilers in the Sweet 16 on Monday. Yeah, agreed. I, I think we are as well. I think they win big. I, I think they can be tested in the round of 32, but they ultimately win, and we'll be giving. You know, we'll have what five, six days to get ready for the second weekend, and they can catch their breath. But I think Purdue fans will have a good time, a safe time, hopefully there uh, at Game Bridge. It's going to be quite the scene for sure. Enjoy the madness, everybody. Have a great weekend. We'll chat with you on Monday. The off 